Oh, it's morning, guys. How's it going? Welcome. Jeez, Myron Standard Time. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the patience. Anyways, this is going to be a good one. Welcome to the stream. Uh, for those of you who may be new, this is actual red pill stuff. It's not so much. Uh, we're not we're not kicking anybody out for drinking white claws in our podcast. We'll put it that way. It's kind of a bit of a running gag. I usually started off with a gimmick. I didn't do that today. I probably should. Let's hit one in quick. Sounds very paranoid to me. Like Dill Reed is quite paranoid to me, but it does screams a little bit of somebody who is very paranoid on anyone. I think it's. I, I do think there's an element of um, suspicion. Like if if you are feeling a certain level of vulnerability, that I think this guy definitely is. <laughs> Man, these things are great. Uh, no, it's not going to be family. Well, I mean, it's family friendly in that, uh, it's one more please in the chat, by the way, old school man, old school man. It's family friendly in the sense that you'll have a good family by following it. It's not family friendly as in, hey kids, sit down, let's talk about our dicks, you know? So the topic's going to be about history. Hold on a sec, let me get my timestamps out. Everybody's been a huge fan of setting up the timestamps so you guys can see, you know, if you can skip to stuff if you're not so interested in it and catch stuff that you are interested in. You know how it works. You've been here long enough. Um, I'm going to start with some Victorian age stuff and then the history of marriage counseling. Oh my God, is he getting into that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're going to start to see some things here. Um, why you shouldn't give a crap if things are getting worse for men. And that one's going to be kind of a useful one. Statistics were never really right anyways. And then we're going to end off on, because we keep going back, we keep going back to the trough. The trolley problem isn't. And that's actually not what you think it's going to be. That's more about how guys don't really have a mental point of uh, origin or a worldview. So it'll be kind of nice at the end. It's going to suck at the start there. Anywho, um... So we'll get started in just a sec, but I got to give a shout out to the T-Rex army. I see Mish, I see Jack, I see, I see, where is Marty, son of Martin in there? Alex, the Skyriminal Order, all a bunch of great guys, all have their own red-pilled entertainment style YouTube channels full of different stuff. Jack does fitness, Marty sort of streams almost. <laughs> Alex has got like uh, tons of Skyrim stuff. It's good because you know what? Like, if you've been here a while, you understand, okay, the be attractive, don't be unattractive, mental point of origin, a hypergamy, how to raise a how to raise a family and hold on to a wife, maintain a good relationship, great, got it, sorted out, I'm awesome, handled it, alpha of the alphist, alphas that ever alphaed, a tart of alphas. What do I do next? Well, now you gotta go one of two directions. One, you bitch about how all oh, movies are woke right now, or two, is either you go build something that's worth doing. And then spend your leisure time watching stuff that's more more in tune with your sensibilities. And that's where these guys all come in. It's all great stuff. Um, Dave, I don't know if Dave's in the chat. There's green light as well. Again, give them all a follow. Uh, if I haven't wrenched you guys, I'm going to wrench you. So you guys can put the, the links to your channels in there. Like I said, it, they're, all, they're all worth. All worth. Let's wrench up green light. There we go. Uh, rule zero is going to be happening right after this. And that's going to be Clary. <laughs> Can women even read? <laughs> because right now we're going to deal with some like interesting stuff. But afterwards, why not a little bit of whammon ain't shit, you know? Yeah, no worries. Anyways, getting to the point. What do... No, Ryan Stone, I'm, I see he's the most important guy in the world. Ryan Stone, give a fuck about Ryan Stone. Or me and him have gone back and forth, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a fuck with Ryan Stone. C-SPAN rule zero. <laughs> I swear to God, I hope this guy doesn't die of cancer because I'm gonna look like such a dick for all these ones every time I milk that. Okay, the Victorian area stuff. What the heck is he talking about? There is a common theme among guys how do i put this they're they're sexually not successful 
But it's not because they're not attractive. It's not because of any reason other than they hamstring themselves because everybody that's been around them has hamstrung them. It's like that movie Misery where she grabs the sledgehammer and she's like, the penguin always faces east. Crack, crack, crack. Had a friend like this in college. I remember this. Dude, he literally looked like Superman. Six foot two, lantern jaw. Not lantern jaw. What's the square jaw, dark hair, blue eyes. Like even he used to just dress up. He would just put on like a blue shirt and everybody said he said Superman for the thing. Uh, really, really devout Christian. And I remember there was this one chick trying to pick him up one day. And uh, she's like, man, I need to get you laid. And he's like, where am I going to find a wife that fast? <laughs> like, that's the kind of guy was. He got married, ended up having a family and some kids. So good for him. It worked out. But here's the thing. Not everybody's going to nail that landing. The equivalent of a guy holding out for marriage and virginity and all that stuff is kind of the equivalent of a porn star hoping to get married, have a wonderful family. Some people do nail it, but they give a hope to a lot of people who end up in subpar misery. And the one theme of these people is they always talk about, you know, it used to be better before Tinder. It was always There's always some technology that's within their dating life that changed the game forever. You know, Zoomers are like, dude, before Tinder... It was milk and honey. Everybody was just throwing high quality poon from the sky and wives were popping out. It was great. And then the millennials like, oh, before the internet, it was great. You'd walk up to a girl and talk to her. It was just poon falling from the sky. And then the boomers were like, you know, before the birth pill or yeah, before this. And everybody keeps thinking that there was somehow like 10 years before they started dating. Everything was perfect. And it's it's never been. Like, it's always been like this. The technology has changed, sure, but it's always been like this. <laughs> it's always been like this. And then I remember I used to, back before I really honed in my, my shit posting, top of the funnel Twitter activities, I used to go into the history books and bring up some stuff. Because if you guys don't know, my first degree was in art history, which meant I was pretty good at under. It's like history, but prettier. And the one thing that was interesting about the post-renaissance period like the baroque was a lot of deacon like a lot of the stuff you think of now as postmodern, they were doing it during the baroque period and a lot of stuff we take for granted like a lot of guys will talk about caravaggio you can go look up the artist he's probably like the most famous baroque painter he'd paint jesus with dirty feet a lot of stage lighting and that essentially deconstructing and going against the renaissance stuff but nowadays we look at it as the same thing. It's like a spaghetti Western. Everybody's like, oh, I love Westerns. You know, Clint Eastwood. Technically, he was deconstructing the Western as a satire. That's why That's why he, like, who was the other guy? John Wayne hated him. He's like, you never shoot a man in the back. He goes, why? He's dead faster. Same thing with dating. So the Victorian era had a period called the Rococo. And it was all about very Puritan, you know, Jane Jane Austen novels kind of stuff. Everybody's dressed prim and proper. Nobody nobody does the evil sex thing. But then behind the scenes, and Troy loves this stuff, you have seedy little things like absinthe bars. And that was one of the funniest things I found is when you look up absinthe bars and they were worse than we are today. I don't care how many OnlyFans you got. You go to a bar, you put the sugar cube, you burn it over to absinthe, and they're jerking each other off in the in the bars. Like that was it. It was literally like a sex club. And you got all these Victorian people. And then you kind of look into it further. There was porn back then. Yeah, it's not on video. It was just pictures, but same thing. And so you realize, as you look back through history, it's always been the same. Women have always been the sexual selectors. People have always gotten sex on the down low. People have always done stuff that they're not proud of. And they don't tell their future husbands. But they had fun in the past. Girls were always cheating on their husbands. You know, the ones that were did, the ones that didn't did. The only difference is, if you don't bother to even look at history, you can make up whatever you want. And nothing makes me laugh harder than a bunch of, you know, American conservative blah, blah, blah. And they're laughing at woke people because, uh, oh, you guys just make up words and they have definitions. You make up this, you make up that, and everything means something else, and I don't get it. And then, meanwhile, they just make up their own history. So I thought, I mean, isn't that always the way, though? Everybody always projects the thing that they're most guilty of onto other people. And the problem is everybody's guilty of it. So everybody's just projecting it. So we pick some team sport and we go at it. Yay. 
our drag queens are better than your drag queens, you know? It's ridiculous. But from a red pill perspective, the whole point of learning this stuff, it's no different than just swapping notes. It's just the people that were giving you the notes early on are dead, dead and gone now. So you kind of have to grab what you grab. So things have never changed. They never really have. Yeah, Zach in the chat here. I spoke to a woman my mom's age at a bar and she was ranting about how back in her day, all women were just looking for husbands. I mean, eventually they are. That's the thing. And you can't really trust women with the notes. This is the one thing that I kind of feel bad for. Like, guys, the red pill thing came pretty, pretty fluently. Pickup thing came pretty fluently. Even the MGTOW thing. Guys, when we get together, we'll focus on a task to the exclusion of all others and tend to swap, like, copious amounts of notes on it. It's what, it's what we're good at. We need to go hunting, get a bunch of guys together. We will invent the spear. We will invent the spear. We will invent the track shoe. And we will invent bitching about the women back home. But yeah, and they, and women have tried it. They try it every now and again. Like you saw the female dating strategy. It was originally, I was even kind of hopeful. I'm like, it's great. It's super toxic. They were toxic. They hate man this. They hate men this. And everybody's like, can you believe these broads are so delusional? And I kind of looked. I'm like, bro, have you looked around the red pill space? <laughs> like, look, I get it. The whole misogyny thing. I'm not like the, like, it, it is, it is pretty shitty. <laughs> it is a pretty big, pretty giant piece of shit. You don't have to argue about that. Everybody seems to want to apologize. No, it's good. It's 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 righteous anger. It's useful anger. But their anger is bad. It's like, dude, let them vent. <laughs> the female tradition of yelling at dudes that they don't like, it's like goes far, far back further than us. But the thing we were hopeful for is, well, maybe maybe then they'll start, you know, once you get that out of your system, you kind of develop some strategy. And they never really did. They never really did. It was just like... It ended up just becoming this weird coping strategy fan fiction. And so they tried that. And then the trad wives tried that again. I can't remember what it was called. Uh, I, Rolo keeps mentioning the name of the goddamn thing. I can never remember it. Sisterhood club or something like that. And they always try and do it. It always ends up being a coping strategy because women, women don't, women collaborate, but they're not, or they're communal, but they don't collaborate. It's how the, the female and the male social matrix works. You can see Ian Ironwood has got some great work on this stuff where men tend to have like a, a gatekeeping mechanism. So if you're a guy and you want to come into somebody's squash club, the guys are going to be kind of like, eh, I'm not too sure about him. You go in there, play a couple games of squash. You, oh, he's actually pretty good. All right, you're in the club. That's it. Entrance exam, wholehearted acceptance. It takes a lot to get kicked out of that club. And more often than not, they kind of police their own to make sure everybody does this thing. It can be a good thing. If you're playing on a sports team, making sure everybody's playing on the sports team well is great. It could be a bad thing too. Take that aforementioned, like the trads talk about putting in your pants and being a virgin and saving it till marriage. Hobbling and hamstring in the next generation of, of good conservative men, right? It's just a tool. You can use it for good or evil. But women, yeah, it's not so much. They instantly, anybody, you put, they're like, <laughs> this is a bad reference. So don't take this bad. It's like just throwing dogs in a cage. They'll automatically start getting along. But, but it's a constant jockeying for position. So it's just a giant, it's like, that's why soap operas are so popular among women. Because they like the idea of all these women automatically getting along just because they're women. Sisterhood, Uber, Alice. And they will absolutely, you know, if anybody comes after the, the one of the women in the group, they're coming after all the women in the group. There's that part of it. Yes, but... Between the women in the group, they all hate each other. They all hate each other. They all fight for position. When one girl gets something better than the other girls, they drag her down. It's like a it's like a condo meeting. It's like a a homeowners association meeting. It's like a mess meeting in the navy. Oh, one guy got like yeah. Uh, it's like the saying: Americans will turn down a great deal if it means their neighbor gets a good one. Yeah, backstabbing crabs and bucket. That's absolutely what it is. So I don't think they're capable of it. In fact, the best place I've seen where women can swap notes was the Red Pilled Women subreddit. And that's because guys run it. There's, uh, I think it's Whisper, Human Sock Puppet, and Red Pill School are like the top guys. And they quash any, like, you know, whatevers and just like stay focused on the thing. And I think their girlfriends are like the head mods. Started a little bit of drama because there was a bunch of chicks that used to be in there. Uh, some Catholic girls. <laughs> They, they went by the name Tempest in a Teacup, which, you know, apt. Uh, Atlas B. Shrugging. She was the racist Catholic girl who swears she's not racist or Catholic, but then will drop a few N-bombs. 
And then they thought it's like, this is just some like weird harem breeding ground for these guys. And then they raised a big stink and caused some things. There's a mid watch coming up about that one in the next, uh, this year. I don't remember whenever I get around to it, there's like another 40 episodes to go. So it's pretty good. Anyways, the point of this is this stuff was all 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, things haven't changed. So when you look up today at the current breed of podcast where it's, Hey, I'm going to get chicks drunk get them to run their mouth and then kick them off my podcast. And then somebody else is like, Hey, we can do a white version of that. And then they do the white version of that, where they get the girls drunk off of like apple ciders and crantinis and then kick them off their podcast. <laughs> it's just all the same. The problem with the new stuff though, is it's kind of, it's changing in the sense that men are being catered to with female sensibilities and it's kind of working. So that's the scary part. So what do you do about this? I mean, the easy answer is just like, if it's not in your worldview, ignore it. Cad had the greatest saying on this one. Anything that's not inside your, your frame is amusing, intriguing, or funny. And he's absolutely right. You shouldn't be watching crap like this. I mean, sometimes it's nice to, to slum it. Don't get me wrong. I used to love Jerry Springer back in college to sit down and, dude, I'm watching the rednecks get each other pregnant, hit each other with chairs. This is awesome. All right, back to class. So like, I get it, but it's, there's a certain type of guy and they're the guys that aren't there yet who kind of really need to like detox from it. And I hate using detox. I hate talking about it like drugs because it removes an agency. It's like, well, it's not my fault. It's the dopamine that causes me to be a piece of shit. It's like, no, no. And that may be true in the sense that, yeah, your hormones drive behavior, but you're the one steering. Don't blame the brakes because you didn't push them. Uh, yeah, so Victorian area stuff, this stuff never changed. It, ne it never changed. It's always been like this. It's always ever going to be like this. Nothing's ever going to change. All the technology is doing is changing the manner in which it expresses itself. And this is where you, as a guy who's trying to build a better life, understands that you have to adapt to the mechanisms. And the best way to do that is to understand the underlying systems in place from the Victorian age till now. Women have always been women. Men have always been men. The worst case scenario, you get a subset of men who are being raised as defective women and women being raised as defective men, but that doesn't change anything. There's still that underlying female and male dynamic in place. And it's just, again, the technology changes and you adapt to it. I'll give you, a, everybody seems to want sailor stories now, which I don't understand because they really suck. All of, I hated all of my sailor stories. Such a piece of shit. So here's, here's a good one. Uh, my trade when I was in the military was called naval communications. It's the top secret. You know, oh, it, so it sounds great. Sounds great. Eh, not so much. It just is what it is. Um, so you do 1990s, and there were like a couple big changes happened. Um, Chrétien, that was the the Bill Clinton of uh, of Canada. Really funny guy. Check out a check him out choking a reporter. That was always that was when I missed our prime ministers. They were good. No liberal prime minister choking out a reporter and not even apologizing for it. Uh, impeccable. I see. I'll get you in a second. Let me just finish the story. Anyway, they cut all the funding for the military. And so they really had to start cutting corners. And one of the things that the powers that be decided was that we had too many trades and we had to condense them. So that way more people like less people doing more jobs so we can fit in with these budget cuts. Um, signalmen, bridge watch keepers and sparkers, or they called our radio radio operators. They merged them into a single trade called Naval Communications. And then when IT started coming onto the ships, we started getting our own computers. They kind of melded all three of those. So one guy had to do three different trades. The thing is, nobody could know everything. And so the old guys just stuck to their specialty and you hopefully like put enough guys that could work around each other to get it done. But the new guys didn't learn how to be good sparkers. They didn't learn how to be good signalmen. They were never caring whether you called them a snack or a yeoman senior naval communications or uh yeoman was the senior bridge watch keeper i think it was something like that those are like the fancy titles it's like calling somebody skipper like calling a captain skipper it's the nicknames uh, i see you there bish i'll get you in a sec um oh so what did you end up doing you just learned about the fundamentals it was all about the theory how do how does the the radio ship shore stuff work how does uh circuits work how does a has a black patch panel work how does communications work and then once you understand all the underlying stuff you would know okay so we're having this problem you'd know which books to go to get some references you'd know which thing to get here so you always had to adapt so no matter what 
technology happened. You ended up being agnostic to all of it. Whenever there was an upgrade, a big retrofit, maybe a piece of uh, equipment ended up being obsolete and they replaced it, you were easily able to adapt. And in the same way that we did that, you kind of have to do that with sex now. The only difference is like, you know, we haven't made approaching girls during the day obsolete yet. Uh, be impeccable, $7.77 super chat. That Tate segment is gold. If I see or hear your name anywhere, Tate's Ryan's toy and voice points in my head every time. That's the plan, sir. That's the plan. I hate to say it. And it's one of those, this is a top of the funnel thing. It's mostly just for yucks. I don't, that's not like I care. But the best advice, if you ever decide to do a brand yourself on social media, the best advice is take something that you want to be known for. In my case, it's like pissing off the right people. And you have to hammer it, hammer it to the point that it's like muscle memory in the audience's head. And then that kind of builds us like an internal dialogue. It's how we can talk to each other. And it's something we can have. And it's a fun joke. It's good. Uh, Silver Bishop, five euro, one cent. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Human nature changes, but none of us are alive now. We'll see it. Oh, yeah. And that's the ultimate point. If you want to talk about a fundamental change in human nature, like where the fundamental underlying issues change, that's going to be eons thousand years like ideally you'd probably still be just as good picking up women in the roman empire as now the only difference is some of the situations so that gets you there where'd i leave off oh right the sailor story and then the changes so never forget no matter what new technology comes it's always gonna it's always gonna be the same actually here's a great example of this every every two two to five years the MGTOWs, the men going their own way, the He-Man Woman Haters Club of the world. <laughs> they decide that this new technology is going to change everything. And that once it goes through, once it goes through, women will start acting right because they won't be able to catch a man because they'll all be over here with this tech. Uh, is my earliest memory. I remember they said that about birth control. Oh, this changes the game. I mean, it did change the game, but not as much. Then guys started having their own pullback things. Oh, porn. They brought it out of the theaters. It's on VHS tapes now. This is going to change the game. A guy can just go to a video store, grab the hottest women doing the craziest thing, and he'll never need And the women will start acting right. And they never did. They never did. They, everything just was exactly the same. At the same time, they had uh, DVDs started coming. Oh, now it's like ultra slim and great. It'll be perfect. And nothing ever changed. And then on top of that, they changed it again. Uh, one sec. Uh, where did I leave off? Oh, yeah. So uh, they did the DVDs. Same thing there. Next up is they thought the internet. Oh, the internet's going to change anything. Pornhub, women will start acting right because guys can just look at porn all day. Didn't change anything. Then it was sex dolls. Oh, we're going to get the sex dolls and... Chomsky, come here. The sex dolls and women are going to change everything. Never did change anything. Come here, pupper. Come here. Never did change a thing. Never did change a thing. And now it's AI. AI is going to change everything. Never changes anything. And just remember this, too. Every time somebody talks about how, like, some technology is going to change everything, it never changes anything. It just does what it does. Nothing's ever going to change. Everybody's always going to be the same. And you still have to just learn to talk to women because what else are you going to do? Protect that thumb. Yes, that's the, uh, I guess if you guys don't know, that's the latest thing. So he got in a fight and then uh, lashed out, caught me in the thumb, tore out a chunk of it. And it's been messed up ever since. I got to respect this dog. 13 pounds, one kill already. Grabbed a bird right out of the air. Three teeth. So each pound bite force is intense. Yeah, it changes so slow so you can't tell it's happening. Exactly. It's so slow that you'll die before any fundamental changes happen. That's just it, though. And here, these subtle changes, they're easily adaptable. You know how easy it is to go from hitting on girls at the bar to hitting on girls on Tinder? Like, there's a couple changes. Yeah, your profile pic matters a lot. Don't put a lot in your bio. Um, 
there was a whole bunch of systems to that. Uh, what are the other ones that guys talked about? Try to have photos of you like playing sports with friends as an excuse to take your shirt off to show that you're in shape. Don't do the bathroom selfies. Try to have pictures with you with other girls to simulate pre-selection. It's all the same things that you would do when you're at the bar or picking up a girl from church or whatever. The only difference was you would just adapt it to an online environment. So yeah, but this is a change and people will say, well, now it's too hard. And I hate to say this and I've yet to see an example of it not being true. Passport bros, online bros, all the bros. Oh, I'm going to go to Thailand and then I'll get a wife. It's like, if you can't pick up girls here, you're not going to be able to do it in Thailand. If you can't do it on uh, on offline, you're probably not going to be able to do it online either. There's some fundamental skills underneath that you just have to adapt to each new technology. And that's all it is. So the Victoria era stuff. Remember, think about that. Think about the doctor who's like, oh, you seem to have some hysteria in your blood. Let me use a vibrator on you for 20 minutes and then give you some cocaine. Like, that's what it used to be like. You'll be fine. You will be just fine. Now, on that note. I usually post pictures of my kids online, but they're infants and you can barely see them. So, you know, it's, it's fine. But a YouTuber named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone tweeted, showing off the F trophies for clout. So the babies are trophies that I'm showing off. It's perhaps not a surprise that a picture of a proud father would be so upsetting to the sort of man who clearly never had one. So marriage counseling, the history of marriage counseling. I always get his name pronounced wrong. So I'm pulling it up quickly here. Papano, I believe his name is. That's the one. Paul Papano. If you guys ever look this stuff up, this is for guys who are in, in marriages or relationships or co or you want to get dating coaches and shit like that. Everybody's like, oh yeah, why wouldn't you talk to this guy? What's the, uh, the Gottman school, I think is what they call it for everybody here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not really as good as you think it is. It's really not. How do I know this? Well, you look at the guy who invented it. This guy's name's Papano. He was some American and he had two passions. Uh, one was eugenics and the other one was eugenics. He was talking about, you know, breeding master race stuff as an American. Interesting enough. And then, oh, dude, they're trying this out in Europe right now. This would be a great little case study. Um, after about the 40s, they did about 20 years of study. And part of it was not just the eugenics aspect biologically, but the eugenics, eugenics aspect like psychologically and socially. And part of that involved marriage counseling. I remember I used to work for, when I used to work in Edmonton selling fur coats, it was like a brief stint I had as like the original, the original Canadian job selling fur coats for the Hudson Bay company as a fur trader. <laughs> um, that's like the equivalent of American being a, a railroad maker. I don't know what's the original American job. Frontiersman, whatever. Anyways. Uh, she was a German chick. She was old, like an older German chick. She was around and she remembers like her mom used to tell her stories about she had to, when their parent, when her parents got married, they had to show paperwork that they had at least six generations of German blood in them and stuff like that. And they had to talk amongst each other. And then the state would come in. And it's like, all right, we need to have a talk about marriage, what you're doing, how you want to have kids, all of this controlling stuff. And it's a lot, it's similar to what the Catholic church or the, the Christian churches have been doing for eons. The only difference was in the same way that uh, religion was training people to do certain things to be good for the country, the religion, the king, the pope, whoever. The communists and the, and I can't believe we're doing Godwin's law here, but it, it matters. It matters and it's coming to a point. I promise just bear with, bear with the Austrian painter references. We will get there. I swear. Trust me. Uh, they did the same thing, but to a secular level. Now, after the Americans came in and cleaned house and the Russians came in and also cleaned house and then they decided, all right, Berlin, let's stop right here. You take this half. I'll take this half. We'll talk again in 1989. They're like, yeah, sounds good. Um, so Papano was like, ah, oh, this eugenics thing, really unpopular right now. So he did what every other bullshit artist grifter brand does. He pivots and then he pivoted into marriage counseling. And then that became his new grift where it was a way that you could communicate better with your wife 
and then you could keep marriages together and make them stronger than ever. But don't forget, don't ever forget, whenever you talk about marriage counseling, there's always a history, like an Austrian, it's like a Hugo Boss, VW Bug, Fanta, IBM. It's all about the same. It's all got that same little history. Hypothermia, medical knowledge. I had a podcast with some debate chick about this. She's like, you can't separate things from their morality. You have to make them moral. I'm like, well, you know, all my first aid knowledge about hypothermia kind of came from some evil shit. Should I just ignore that? Well, no, no, that's different. I'm like, yeah, of course it's different. Because <laughs> because now your argument makes no sense. But that's the point. So be aware of that. Well, how good is it? I don't know. How good was eugenics? Didn't seem to work out too well. Master race lost out to uh, production, mask production capabilities. Same, almost like the same as guys dating. Yeah, planned parenthood, all that stuff. Yeah, I guess the difference is Ryan is right. Hugo Boss, at least Hugo Boss looks cool and worked. It always, it relied on a fundamental premise that was really wrong. It's that communication can fix things. And the idea of, and this is like a 18th century kind of, 19th century kind of thing anyway. Like the Darwinists believed in that. Um, phrenologists believed in that. There was a whole lot of pseudoscience back then because people didn't know what they were doing. Kind of like today, but with a lot less lab coats. Um, and they thought, well, if you can just talk about it, but they realized that people, they didn't realize at the time, people don't do things based on communication. People do things based on their biological imperatives and their brains mostly exist to post hoc justify it. What the hell's that mean? Well, that just means, and this is why you always see girls, like they'll say one thing and they'll do another thing. And then they'll argue like, I never said that. It's because at each individual moment, they'd make a decision that's best for them. At least instinctually, they believe it is. And then their brain post hoc justifies it. This is why it's not useful to argue with your wife because you guys aren't arguing about the same thing. She has no memory about the stuff she argued about before unless it makes her case. And that's good. You never take me out to dinner anymore. What are you talking about? We went out to dinner two days ago. Yeah, well, we never go out to dinner anymore. You're like, what the hell? I literally went there. We said this. We did this. You never take me out to dinner. Why don't you love me? Why are you yelling at me? And that's when you realize as a guy, oh, okay. This is why Agree and Amplify, Amuse Mastery, Cocky Funny, and all those things and fogging exists. You never take me out to dinner anymore. Yeah, I can kind of, like, I get it. I get why you'd think that. Probably doesn't feel like it, does it? You never take me out to dinner anymore. Damn right. <laughs> One blow job per one hamburger. That's the deal, madam. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've heard I never said that. Not just from girls, but guys too. Again, I keep putting it out there. And I know it's a very convenient thing, but it's just, it's a good way to understand this stuff. Men are being raised as if they are defective women. And increasingly so. All of these... Um, strategies for intersexual dynamics are increasingly applying to guys. Now, if it makes you feel better, you can always just say that there's so much overlap between men and women. And we're basically even the, those blank slate guys. Oh, everything is basically equal. You can even say then that, well, that's great then. So all this stuff works for men and women, but because I don't want to sleep with men, I'm not going to use it on men. And that's fine too. Like I said, all roads lead to Rome. As long as you get there, you get there. Yeah, Henry Ford was a eugenics guy, an all-around weird dude. They were all weird back then. Of course, nowadays, what we have is, like, the... And this is one of those... This is one of the first shit posts I think I ever did on the Rule Zero thing, where I was like, abortion is the crowdsourced ad hoc eugenics program one run by women. And it essentially is. Everybody reads that, and they're like, wait a minute, no. And they're like, that's kind of right, but that's a little bit messed up. It is. It is. So, what's the takeaway for you? Before we do that, Marchese, 100 Rons. Thank you very much, sir. What's a Ron? I got to look this up. Sometimes I see currencies I don't know. And it always makes me interested. Romanian. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> Romanian lose. Well, sir, a top G to you this morning. Uh, Non-covert contract super chat. Way to say thank you for your content. Well, you know what? I'm going to give you two heartfelt cuck articles for the $10. <laughs> that's the that's the unit of measurement for the channel. Cuck articles. That's $5 per cuck article. So heartfelt, fuck you. Heartfelt, fuck you. <laughs> no, thank you, sir. Thank you. 
Yeah, tape money. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. It'll be wonderful. I'd appreciate it. Just don't get murdered out there, you know. With that, uh, with that mafia now losing their top members, it's probably a giant power vacuum there. I need more Romanian cuck articles. Well, I mean, if you had to choose between getting cucked by your girl and having your girl rat you out to the feds, I'd probably take the cucking. If I had to, if I had to choose, I'd prefer neither. That's the that's the real Megan Fox Hulk Hogan article. Oh, and that's. <laughs> I forget. So if you're not on Twitter, you may not know this, but that's the newest thing was like, I guess Tate did a video last year where he's telling guys like, if you had to choose between Megan Fox with a dick and Hulk Hogan with a vagina, that you should probably, I don't remember which one he ended up sleeping with, but at that point I'm just like, done, turn it off, throw out a meme, call it a day, move on. Uh, back to Back to business though. Yeah, the marriage counseling stuff. And you realize this. Okay, so when you think of marriage counseling today, it's treated as an authority, you know? The courts treat it as an authoritative source. In fact, a lot of people can't get divorced unless in jurisdictions they can't get divorced if they don't go through a round of marriage counseling. So essentially this non-therapist, he's like the chiropractor of physiotherapy, of, uh, of psycho or psychotherapy, clinical psycho or clinical psychiatry. He's the chiropractor of clinical psychology. Cucker jail, choose Western man. <laughs> How would you open, brother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but it's treated as an authority, and that's the problem is now. So, and this is where you're kind of seeing female nature, that like will to power, Machiavellian instinct come out. Because if I can't get divorced unless we go to a marriage counselor, well, then I'm just going to go there as a tick in the box activity. Go to the marriage counselor. Oh, I tried everything. Sorry, guys, it just didn't work out. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Screw that guy. Let's go and be friends together. That's how it ends up playing out. Marriage counselors know this, too. They know it's a grift. But that's the problem is that you're invested now. You got skin in the game. Imagine this. You go to school for, I don't know, six, seven weeks. You draw the turtle or the pirate. You go to DeVry. You get your marriage counseling Gottman certificate. You, you, you're you saving lives. and You do all these talks and everybody thanks you for it. And then marriage counselors do say things behind the scenes which was funny. We had some very revealing marriage counselors uh, on the married red pill back in the day. And the one thing they said was because everybody's wondering like, why does marriage counseling not work? And why is it always appealing to the girl? Most guys were noticing I got in there and it was basically two people tag team and me saying I needed to do more dishes, make her more comfortable. Cause then maybe she'd fuck me more. And then I did that. And then she got mad at me. And then we go back to the counseling and I'm like, well, maybe try more of this. And there was two reasons for that. One, Couples that tend to be on the rocks tend to have a girl who's either in charge or so resentful and not on the right team on the on the team of the couple that they tended to drive whether you went to marriage counseling. Guys don't want to go to marriage counseling. They never do. They were just told you have to. And so if they want repeat business, then yeah, you better appeal to the girl. She's like, I like that marriage counselor. It's like, of course you would. He told you everything was wrong with the husband and had he had to do a bunch of stuff to appease you. Of course you're going to like him. But then she drags him back and she drags him back. So as a marriage counselor, the ones who appealed to the feminine sensibilities tended to do well business wise. And the ones that didn't tended to lose business, die off and go, you know, start a plumbing business, whatever. And a lot of people think, well, oh, that just means they're like evil and insincere and they're lying to you. It's like, no, it's it's like it's more insidious than that. It's. The ones who convince themselves that they're doing good work and appealing to the feminine sensibility, whether by accident or post hoc justification, thrive. So you kind, of almost have, you kind of almost have to select for people who are willing to lie to themselves over this kind of thing. There is some people, though, that are jaded. They understand the game dynamics. And these were the interesting ones. So there was like, a, I wish I could remember the guy's name. I can't remember, but I remember the conversation. It was... For a lot of them, they realize that when you can give all of these conflict resolution strategies, in fact, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in No More Mr. Nice Guy and Robert Glover's book is the stuff that marriage counselors use too. They took it from, say, uh, from therapy and they applied it to marriage counseling. But what they noticed was when things got emotionally heated, when people started fighting, women got emotional, they threw it all out. I don't care about any of this stuff. And they would go right back to their evolved behavior to yell and nag yelling and nagging meanwhile the guy even though he feels like 
trepidation. He's walking on eggshells, afraid of his wife's emotions. He wants to avoid conflict or all this stuff. So he's following the instructions that he was given from the authority to a T. Again, Dad 2.0 has been around for a lot longer than you think. Just like Victorian times, it's never changed. The marriage counselors found out, okay, so if I tell the man to wash more dishes, he'll wash more dishes, whether he feels it or not. If I tell the girl, lose some weight and put out more, she'll, she'll, oh yeah, I'll totally do that. But then as soon as it involves someone telling her what to do, she just spurgs out. And so they realize, like, what's the point of giving all this advice to somebody if they're not going to take it? And dude, I feel it. I did consulting on this channel for like the first year. And more often than not, when you're telling somebody things that they can do to improve their life in a measurable way, they won't do it. Not only will they not do it, they will come to you saying they did it. And then when you ask them to describe how they did it, they'll describe the exact opposite. And on top of that, and this is the Catholic confession side of the red pill that absolutely drives me nuts, but it's so damn common. They will do this willingly because they want you to yell at them and call them a piece of shit. So that they feel better. I fucked up. He called me a piece of shit. Jesus has forgiven me. But not G real Jesus. Dr. Jesus. Esquire. <laughs> it's this weird Catholic therapy confessional thing. Where all people want is forgiveness. For screwing up. They don't actually want to stop screwing up. They don't want to fix the things that they screwed up on. They don't want to win. They want to feel better. And this is that magic pill stuff that Rich Cooper and Rolo talk about all the time. And you don't want it. You don't want none of it. So you have to make, you have to make a choice. Do I want to be happy or do I want to be right? And I've totally got the thing mixed up. Usually I tell that to people when I say, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? The point there being, you know, got to hold these women accountable. I'm good. They're not. And that's guys who need to be right as opposed to just letting this all go and then working out for your best interest to be happy. In this case, flip it on his head. Do you want to be ha made to feel happy about suffering? Because, you know, well, it's not your fault. On one side, it's not your fault. And on the other side, it's, well, yeah, you were a piece of shit. Either way, some guys wants to feel good or bad about being, you know, subpar. So do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? In this case, you know, don't worry about the counseling, whatever. If you're not going to listen to me when I say how I want, how my expectations need to be delivered on a woman that's in my life, then clearly you don't want to be here. Why do you want to fight so hard for a relationship where the other person doesn't want to be there? I would argue... The best use of your time then. And this is this is mostly red-pilled consensus. I think there's some exceptions. For the most part, it was like, if she doesn't want to be here, if she doesn't find me attractive, like that hypergamous best option attractive, fine. I'm going to use you as a training dummy. If I can sleep with you, that's known me like 10 years of me at my worst or however long it's been and doesn't want to sleep with me and super entitled and thinks you demand this and demand that. If I can game you, I can game anybody. And so guys put in the work to kind of like practice game against a really hard target. And then you go get a second opinion and you maybe go flirt around with the office girls or you just go out to the bar one day, talk, or you meet some friends that are single and you meet their friends and you find out, oh my God, chicks are throwing it around. It is so much easier than I thought. And it's this trial by fire thing. Dev, I see I'll get to you in a sec. It's like a trial by fire. The training always has to be harder than like the actual event though. Like I remember that when we deployed our workups training before then, absolutely brutal in the box. Perfect. It was nice. It was calm. It was relaxed. Sad to say I actually had an easier workload and less stress in the deployment zone of operations than I did going to the zone of operations. It's the same they do with training. When you're training to be a clearance diver or a search and rescue tech or JTF, the training is absolutely and psychologically and physically brutal. Because the event there is nice. Because they just want to see if you're capable. And then once you're there, I'll just use it. Use it if you need it. If you don't need it, we're not going to punish you for the sake of it. And it's the same thing with game. Of course, a lot of guys run into problems with that. Because they think they're doing it as a covert contract. I'm going to win my wife back. And if I just do all these things, tips and tricks, then she'll love me forever. We'll have a conflict-free life. And this is where guys end up wasting that first two years. I talk about it in Praxeology, Volume 1, Frame, out in uh, Audible, iTunes Store, Amazon, Kindle. I might put an issue out in Kobo. And yes, a hardcover. <laughs> I keep getting asked about the hardcover. It's on the list. I'm just being lazy right now because I'm still in the I hate that piece of shit book mode. Bear with me. 
And I've got a bunch of these ones that I know some of you guys there I promised copies to. I've got your copies. I've just got to sign them and send them out. Uh, before we get back to this, Dark Knight Dev, $5 super chat. Thank you very much, sir. I see men on social media who complain about girls not being trad. My old man has six baby mamas and ain't nothing trad about that, so what do you want to do? Oh, dude, me too. Heartfelt fuck you for the $5, by the way. That's one cuck article. Uh, Yeah, my grandmother, as tr and she was the embodiment of trad. El Nora passed away, I don't know, like 99, 2000, something like that. And, uh... I remember this. So they, she was one of those girls that like, she doesn't want dice in her house because those are the devil's tools. No board games because it was all dice. The only game she had was like two horseshoes welded together and you got to get a ring in and out of it. That was all she'd play with. She used to sing gospel hymns in the house. They had a truck, but they only ever drove it to church. She only, she had one set of clothes for Sunday church and the rest for work and they worked on a farm. They had been together for 40 years. That was her third husband, by the way. Widowed once, divorced once because the guy was abusive, had 20 kids. 10 adopted, 10 normal. As trad as they come, still two ex-husbands and a third husband. Got it right the third time. They eventually died six months apart. It was actually kind of sweet. It's one of those heartfelt moments, like an actual one, not the Jack Murphy one, where I think she passed away first and Grandpa Romeo lasted six months and then he died and everybody was like, oh, he died from loneliness, which, I mean, it's a pretty adorable, but at the same time, even theirs wasn't great. Like a lot of a lot of my uh, aunts and uncles went to prison, stupid stuff, infighting amongst the family. So even the trad life was never as trad as you think. And they were like, like this is how old school they were. My grandfather's tractor was like from, it was like the first tractor, like the brand name was Tractor. At the point where like every year he's like somebody, some collector would always come down. He'd offer him a crazy amount of money for this tractor. And he's like, well, what am I going to drive? It was like so sweet. He was always, he was always very sincere that way. Oh, if you like this, you could buy two tractors. He's like, yeah, but what am I going to drive? For him, he just liked it. Cause like all I need is a wrench and hammer and I can fix anything on this tractor. You buy me that new John Deere. It's going to have no right to repair curved windows. It's like, I don't need all that crap. I don't need GPS. I just need a tractor. Uh, Doug Chisholm, $49.99 super chat. See, this is why Doug is better than you guys. Cause he understands how to avoid the cuck article. <laughs> All it takes is a penny, just a penny. Uh, this space is better than any marriage counseling. Marriage counseling is a checkbox item. I have been told by many a female men forego marriage counseling and come to this space, compare notes, implement and adjust. Thanks Ryan. Yeah. Oh dude. After the 500th time of seeing it, you can kind of take it for fact. Even if your girl is sincere about the counseling your marriage is in trouble and she's like okay so they this is an authority saying if you go here we'll fix your thing wait women have covert oh yes women have covert contracts same as men the difference is you're self-aware enough to fix yours meanwhile they just kind of go with the feelings they always trust authorities in that way so sometimes it is a sincere we went to marriage counseling i tried everything and it didn't work sometimes it's more cynical but functionally it's exactly the same for a guy. So as soon as you hear a girl going to a marriage counselor, it's best to assume that she's already checked out at this point because there's nothing that he's going to say. There's nothing you can do to outsource authority to a third party and expect that authority to glean off onto you. It just doesn't work. So yeah, the history of marriage counseling. And that's kind of, and this is, I like these because these are depressing stories, you know? Like everybody's like, oh, that's fine. We have the church will help you stay to get like, no, the church will take her side. They always do. Well, that's fine. We got marriage counselors. They'll t and like, no, the marriage counseling is not really for you. It's more of like a legal process to screw you over a bunch of people that were trained by Austrian painters on how to make the perfect race. Yeah, you're not getting help there. But what about the old times? It used to be better. It's like, no, it never used to be better. Why are you so negative and nihilistic? It's like, I'm not. I'm trying to tell you. All these little gods you invented in your life, that god it used to be better, the trad god, the marriage counseling god, the Catholic confessional god, all these gods are dead. They're dead, and I don't think they ever really worked to begin with. It was just a story we told ourselves to go to sleep at night. So yeah, everything is wrong. Nobody's out to help you. You're on your own. Congratulations, you're free. And that's really it. And this is like the... And I know I say this often. It never like goes viral on a tweet. It never goes viral on a video, but it really is the most important lesson that I've ever taken from the red pill. Nothing is coming to save you. Nobody is here to help. Everything will probably hurt you if you trust it. Congratulations. Now that you know all this, you're free. I think it's like a Socrates or Plato thing where he's like, uh, 
He called himself the smartest man in the world. And I know one of you guys will correct who I got it from. It's probably some Greek dude. But I'm the smartest man in the world because I know one more thing than everybody else. I know I don't know anything. And he's like, that makes me smarter than anybody else. And it's, there's a certain humility to it where you realize, okay, so if, if everything is a lie, if everything is a social construct, what do I do? What do I trust? If nothing's real, well, that's easy. I see a PP, I see a Jason, I'll get to you one second. Nothing's real. What can I do? Well, you can trust what you can see and what you can touch and what's right in front of you. That's the only things you know for sure. And this matters for everything. This is why red pill is such a great uh, behavioral praxeology for men. Politics. Well, what political, what political thing is actually affecting you? Did January 6 affect you? Unless your name is Pat Stedman. No, it did not. So if you can't see it, you can't touch it. It's outside your frame. It's amusing. It's intriguing or funny. Make a shit post for it. Look into it as a rabbit hole, as a way of entertaining yourself. Just start laughing at how a dude with buffalo horns. They got a new one now. Some LGBT capital storming in Oklahoma. And I made a joke now. Now it's that same buffalo dude, but he's got like rainbow buffalo pelts. All right, PB. $100. That's, uh, oh, geez, that's 20 cuck articles. Gold, new here. Greetings, my fellow pimp. pimp, pimp, pimp. What the hell is that? Pimp? Nippian. Pimp Nippian? Is that even a word? Or you fuck? Or do you just want to see me stutter? I think you wanted to see me stutter on the thing, sir. I'm looking it up. I figure for a hundred dollars, the least I can do. Did you mean Pimp Alpin, which is a TV series? Oh, well, thank you, sir. Happy Game of Thrones to you. <laughs> and then Jason, six dollar sixty nine nine super chat Canadian. Ryan does getting with a woman who has a good relationship with her father, filter out a lot of the BS hypergamy comes with. It filters out... No. The, the bullshit that comes with hypergamy, it's just there. What it does filter for is uh, the means which a girl seeks validation. Now, it's never a guarantee. Some girls learn this because they have a lot of brothers. They have good you know, uncles that don't try to touch them, shit like that. The purpose of a girl's good relationship with her father is that a woman's father is the only girl or is the only man in her life who she wants validation from and can't get it sexually. Obviously. Brothers to a lesser extent, but more so the father. So when a girl's trying to get dad's attention, if she just acts all goofy and stuff and dad's like, I'll cut that out, she stops acting goofy. Maybe she gets into book reading, horse riding, stuff like that. Dad's really proud of her. She continues to do it. Tomboy's a great example of that. I like trucks and horses and that. Why? Because dad used to work on his truck on the weekends and I wanted to spend time with dad. So I'd go out there and he'd show me how to fix the engine. That tomboy, and this is why a lot of guys like tomboys, because they're very good at getting validation from men without using their sexuality. It's wholesome, right? Now, if you don't have a father figure, not necessarily a father, but a father figure. Yes, I get it. Stepdads aren't ideal, but a lot of times stepdads will fill this role. Or really any. Like the family friend had a great dad. And she just kind of latched onto that. There's all kinds of examples. But yeah. For girls that don't have that. For the most part. They don't know how to get validation from a man. Without using their sexuality. Because once they turn like 13, 14, 15. Whatever age it is. That boys start looking at them funny. That's the only thing that seems to resonate. It's the easiest thing that seems to resonate. You know. Teasing boys. Or sleeping with boys. Cock teases and that. So that's, that's really what you're trying to avoid. Now. Having said that, if it's a girl that you're otherwise interested in, there's always ways to get around that. If you're willing to put in the time, and I don't know why you would, because there's girls that don't need this, but if you're willing to put in the time, some girls are like, they always lead with the sex thing, and you can just be like, I hate to say it, but like more disinterested in that, and interested in like, you know, bringing them someplace, and yeah, I just don't embarrass me in public, and shit like that, and yeah, you can put in the work if you want to, if you want to save that person, go ahead, but I'm telling you right now, in general, women don't want to be saved. So yeah, but you're never going to filter out the BS from hypergamy because it's not its not BS. Hypergamy is what makes monogamy. And that's something that a lot of guys keep missing out. They think of hypergamy as a bad thing. Without hypergamy, actually a great example. If you want to see what life is like without a hypergamous filter, go look at the sex scene for gay men. Men aren't hypergamous. They just aren't. So look at, and this is your own rabbit hole. I don't really care to. Again, amusing, intriguing, funny. This one's I kind of find intriguing. 
But if you do a little bit of a cursory search, go down the iceberg of gay relationships, gay marriage, gay uh, sexual promiscuity, you'll kind of see, oh, so that's what women would be like without a hypergamous filter. You're like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what they'd be like. And that's why in the same way that men are being raised as defective women, women are being raised to be defective men. And so what's the part they pick up on that? Women were told for 20 years they could be anything they wanted to. So they wanted to be drunken frat boys and racking up notches. So part of the red pill is like understanding these things, but not attaching a moral system to them. Because frankly, your morals suck. Your parents, everybody around you has given you to them. And I just told you before, like nobody's out to help you. They're out to reinforce what they believe. Whether it helps you is irrelevant. So once you take away all those moral gaslighting filters that you've been given your whole life and you just look at it flat out, what does hypergamy really mean? It means a girl can only look up to one man at a time. And if it's not you, it's somebody else. That sounds bad. Well, geez, I want her to look up to me. Yeah, you do, but she doesn't. So what do you do about that? Either you make yourself more attractive, you stop making yourself so unattractive, or you find somebody else who's more willing to take you up on it. Generally speaking, you kind of move on all three fronts at the same time, and then you just let the outcomes kind of play out. If your wife turns around, starts being more interested in you, and you want to keep her, great. If your wife continues to not be as interested in you or cheats on you or just, you know, continues to go along thinking she's not going to do anything, then yeah, maybe you want to go get a side piece outside the marriage. Maybe you want to open up the marriage, which, you know, whatever. Everything comes with its own cost. Maybe you just want to leave her and start again. Heck, some guys even find after they leave their wife that uh, that that dread of a divorce and they actually start plating their wives again. It's the weirdest thing, but it happens. So yeah, you're never going to filter out hypergamy, but you can understand it to the point that you make better decisions. Same as I said before. Understand the underlying parts of the human condition that you're trying to learn through the red pill, and then all that's left is adapting it to whatever technological, environmental situation you're in. Uh, Alexandra Cease, $5.99 R's. I recommend watching everything, everywhere, all at once. Its main message is nothing matters. Isn't it in a good way? Because I, I, the one thing, like, I get it. Everybody's like, oh, nihilism is blah, blah, blah. And I, yeah, I get it. The first half of nihilism really sucks. But the freeing aspect of it is the part that nobody ever focuses on. And it's because it's hard to get to. You have to go through a lot of misery. Imagine that. Getting zeroed out, it's not fun. Nobody wants that. I'm not going to go through life thinking, like, my wife's leaving me. My social circle leaves me. The church leaves me. My biz, my company fires me. I get a me too act. Like, nobody wants all that shit. But at the end of it, you generally come off as mentally healthier because you have no unreasonable expectations of everything. In fact, you have such low expectations of the world around you that if anybody does something that exceeds your expectations, it stands out. Wow, this girl's not acting like every other girl that I could give two shits about. Maybe she's worth wifing up or turning into a girlfriend or whatever. Obviously, marriage is not a great deal for men, but... That's different than saying don't get married. I mean, I didn't. We're just doing common law, and that's perfectly fine for me. But at the same time, it wouldn't be very red pill if I told you how to live your life. We're not an ideology. It's just a bucket of tools, you know? Is she a good mother to my children? Well, that's the thing, Winemore. It's like you're never going to know that until you actually have children. You can guess. There's ways to, to, to narrow down what makes an option. But I've seen plenty of girls that have had like like major whole type activities when we knew each other back in my sailor days. Now they've settled down and now they're good moms doing mom stuff and you'd never know. The tattoos are gone. You LASIK resu- <laughs> removal surgery. A couple bags under their eyes, they turn into good moms. So at, at the most part, it's kind of a crapshoot. But at the same time, if you're really good with women, and again, where we talked about before, the, the validation seeking stuff. Her doing things that you would consider good motherhood tends to get better validation from you. It's a way of kind of like guiding somebody into the kind of family you want to give. It's not, it's, it's, I mean, it's manipulative, but it's manipulative in the sense that everything is manipulation. It's all about that, but it's never forced. It's like, look, if you want me in your life, this is what I want. This is my expectations. And I think a lot of guys have never had to give expectations out. And this is why they kind of like react so viscerally to this. Like, Weinmar, please. He's a dad, I think. Talk. Oh, I don't want to. 
one way or the other. Let's assume he's a dad for the sake of this. I don't know how private we're going to get, but he has expectations on how he wants his family run. And his like wife or girlfriend decides, okay, well, I like being with him, and so I'm going to adapt to these things. It's a feedback mechanism. The longer they do it, I've got guys in my private community. There's one guy in particular I'm thinking of. I don't want to name him because he might be in chat right now. But uh, he had this. Wife was yelling at the kids all the time, yelling and screaming at the kids. Zero stress or or 100 stress, zero percent ability to handle it. And he just ended up being lashing out the kids. And so it was just such a simple thing. I'm not going to be I don't want to be part of this house where we as parents think yelling at our kids is going to solve anything. And so he and this was like as far as I, like from my experience with him, that was his first real expectation. And that's where he had to learn that hypergamous best option. If you want me, this is the deal. I'm in a house where we're not those bullshit parents yelling at our kids. And so he went through a bunch of things. Like, first off, where is it that I'm leading by bad example? So clean your own house first. Yeah, clean your room, fellow Canadian frogs. Clean your room. Get all that stuff done. Now let's start having expectations. We don't yell at the kids. And this is where all the tools come in. Fogging, a green amplify, amuse mastery. Sometimes just boundary enforcement. A lot of the times it was when the wife's just freaking out. Take the kids, we're out of here. Basically, you leave her to herself. And the family's going to go over here and have fun. And it's almost in in a way of removing that carrot. It's almost like a punishment. Because women hate that when you take their kids. Especially if you're going out for ice cream and you're the fun parent. Why do you get to be the fun parent and I have to be the bad guy? You don't have to be the bad guy. There's all kinds of little examples. Another example that's good is a different person. But um, a unified front. That's another great parenting thing. When a parent makes a decision about the kids, just go with it. Go with it because it's more important that the kids see the parents as a unified front because as soon as there's a wedge in there, as soon as they start undermining each other in front of the kids, they will run a massive shit test through that wedge and you end up with some horrible parenting. Well, mom said that and you're like, no, 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 we're not playing that game. Do what your mother said. If it's something you disagree with, you wait till the situation's finished. You go privately. You're like, all right, in the future, uh, I don't think we're doing that with the kids and you can fight about it or communicate. That's one of those times when communication is probably a good idea to get you both on the same page of like certain parenting strategies. But that's the point. You notice though, and this ties it back to the original point. You don't need a marriage counselor to tell you this shit. You're telling yourself this shit because you've made the work to make yourself your own mental point of origin. You have a worldview you like, you have an outcome you want to achieve, and then you have communication when needed, but it's mostly through your actions that you can do this. Imagine now some dude in a chair telling you how to do this. It's not going to work. As always, everything is everything is dead. Nobody's helping you. You're on your own. So welcome. Uh, it's been a while since we shit on something. Let's shit on something. I'm a bigger red flag than a white guy with a podcast. I'll wait. I am not impressed. I will have you know, I'm like 80% white. The podcast is goddamn good, and I don't want you anyway. You got random Iroquois art and not art on your walls. You're not my type, sir. Or madam. I don't know, you're allowed to say anymore? <laughs> I love this goofy shit. All right, why I don't care if it's getting worse for men. Don't give a shit. Uh, I might actually mix, we're already at an hour in, so I might mix these next two topics. It was going to be why I don't care why it's getting worse for men, and statistics were never right anyways, but we'll see how they kind of blend together. Yeah, why I don't care if it's getting worse for men, and you will see non-stop complaining about it. A couple reasons. One, men are being raised as defective women, and what do women do? They vent. They vent and complain. Do they do that because something's a problem? No, they do it because they want to relive the drama. That's it. That's why a lot of women complain. I've watched, and it's not even like a bad woman thing. It's just a woman thing. I've seen my girl do it. She gets into a fight with her mom over something and nothing or whatever. And it's like, okay, fine, whatever. And then she's telling me about the fight and she can't stop smiling, even though her mom just did some, you know, dick of shit. And I'm like, okay, so I get it. It's like, you just want to, you want to feel, you want to feel something. I understand that. God knows if as a man, if you're like an anime fan, you go to watch Grave of the Fireflies. You're not watching it because it's entertaining. You're watching it because you want to be depressed and hate your life for two hours. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go check it out. Grave of the Fireflies. I will tell you right now, don't watch it in front of your woman because you're going to start crying halfway through. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. 
It's a two-hour story of watching two tit kids slowly die in in post World War II Japan. <laughs> it's like if flowers in the attic seem too chip for you, that's what this is for. <laughs> that's what this is for. So yeah, a lot of guys complain just because it feels good. It feels cathartic, you know. I remember that. I, and it's sometimes it's even like even a masculine way of doing it. So I get it. Um, when I was sailing, we always used to, it, the tech. There was always the tech table. There was the stoker table, which is the engineers, and the tech table. The weapons techs, electronics techs, uh, M techs. Yeah, anyways, the techs always had the same thing. They'd grab their coffee, they'd sit at the tech table, and they'd bitch. The captain's an asshole, the XO's an idiot, my senior officer's going to get me killed, my head of department's an, as tool, everybody's stupid but me. Oh, they were trying to make this part out of aluminum. If you don't fabricate it out of out of steel, that's going to kill somebody and blah, blah, blah. And they'd sit there and they'd drink it for half an hour. They would bitch and moan and complain about everything. And then, all right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. And then they'd get up, they'd put their coffee in the thing and they'd go and they'd go do their job. Guys just complain. Like, we really do. And you got to kind of separate the cathartic complaining from like real complaints. And that's, and I'm not saying that gets better. So for a lot of times, a lot of guys just want to get an attaboy. Yeah, man, sounds like your wife's a real bitch. It's not usually helpful, like other than around friends, because if I'm just bitching to strangers, wow, I fucking hate my wife. She's such a cunt. First thought in my head isn't, wow, his wife must really be a cunt. My, my first thought is, why are you bad mouthing your spouse in front of people? I mean, you picked her. You're the one that sets the expectations. It kind of gives you, it kind of makes like, it doesn't help you reputation wise. It doesn't help you persuasion wise. It doesn't help you brand wise. There's no benefit to it. It's like being on a date and yelling at the waitress. Like, she's not going to think, wow, that waitress is a prick. She's going to think, why is he so mean to people who don't need anything from him? Generally speaking, that's a very good relationship strategy. And this is one of the few that, like, women and men 100% agree on. Don't badmouth your spouse in front of other people. And a lot of wives love to do it. They love to do it. But that's the point. You know why they do it? They do it because nobody told them not to do it. Nobody enforced them. If they did do it, they didn't fucking ditch her. And so if nobody stops a girl from doing something, why would she stop? And now there's so many girls that bitch about their husbands. They have like a reinforcement mechanism. I call him a prick all the time. All the girls in The View do it all day. You're like, all right. But sometimes it just takes that one guy to be like, hey, do that again. I'm fucking out of here. And like mean it. And then a girl's like, oh, Jesus. And it's funny, too, because you'll see you'll see like I, you'll see it. Um, Twitter Mac, the cosplaying girl. You see it from her. Um, I see it in my girl. And you'll and most guys who've like red pill, they fix their marriages, they do things. They uh, they start noticing it. Girls start developing the art of noticing. You'll look at some chicks. They'll come home. It's like, dude, I was out with my friends. You remember, you know, Cindy and Mindy and Kate and whatever. And you're like, yeah. Like all they did is they just sit here and talked about how piece of much a piece of a shit their husband was. I'm like, really? Yeah. I mean, like Steve? Yeah, they didn't like, like, fucking Steve's a prick. Like, what did you say? It's like, I was like, I don't like my guy. It's like, I'm not going to tell him about our fight last week or something like that. Are you crazy? Why would I bat? Why would I shit talk you in front of friends? And it was like, it's a very sweet moment where guys realize, like, this is that, like, Pergamus best option thing. She's like, no. It's... The man a girl picks is a reflection of her. And when girls understand that and start acting better, and for a lot of girls, they may pick that up naturally. Again, good fathers, that sort of thing. But a lot of girls, it's just because they're with a man who won't put up with it. And so they adopt it as their own sensibilities, their own mental point of origin. That's the, that's what I talk about all the time with narcissism and borderline personality as the male and female personality disorders, or I guess disorders, yeah. If you take a pathological level of borderline, you get a BPD chick tries to stab you in your sleep, steal your dog, and hides in your bushes to stalk you for six months. You get a healthy level of that, and you get a girl that doesn't shit talk you in front of friends and family because she knows you won't like it, therefore she doesn't like it. It's not that she knows you won't like it and she like convinces herself of it, she truly believes it. Oh, we're just going to watch the San Francisco 49ers. You never used to watch football. Yeah, but he's really great and I love the 49ers. She doesn't love the 49ers. She loves you. Nobody loves the 49ers. She loves you. And so her brain is like, well, guess you're loving what he loves. And, she, and you're like, all right, sounds good. And they just go with it. It's awesome. Yeah, and that's another thing about the bitching. Most people just bitch because it's easier than fixing it. It's the way of like, uh, 
dismissing something you can't have. That's why people bitch about the modern dating marketplace. And they invent all kinds of justifications. Well, it's it's Tinder's fault I'm not getting laid. If it, if we were on a farm and I had to sleep with my first cousin to keep the clown alive or whatever, I'd been in. I'd have been swimming in cousin poon. You're like, no, you wouldn't. You'd have been that guy stabbed in the stomach, and the guy would have slept with your wife. It's like I don't know what to tell you. Prima nocta, sir. So yeah, and then on top of that, the guys that bitch about things don't want to solve things. So another reason I don't care if it's getting worse for men is because the men that are complaining aren't the men that are solving problems. I don't care who you are. You can talk. If your perspective is that of like a, a celibate man or a, a nagging wife, quiet desperation marriage, your perspective on women and on sex and on the current trend of technology is probably pretty fucking brutal justifiably so don't get me wrong i'm not saying it doesn't exist it just it exists for you what i'm also saying is it doesn't have to exist for you but that's the problem with the internet you start to build communities they always talk about community it's not a community it's a fucking forum we just used to call them forums now it has to be a community you know i can't just talk to bill bill and i have to have a, a philosophical love for each other is ding and but like, ah, fuck off and so now that's what happens you can believe anything you can think, I want to dress up in a dog costume and fuck another dude in a dog costume. There's a community for that. I want to never get laid ever, and I want to buy a sex doll. There's a community for that. I want to Photoshop chicks' heads onto porn star bodies and make AI porn so I can jerk off to my favorite streamer. There's a community for that. It's a pretty popular one, too. That's the crazy part. So not only, it's almost like VLANs for people, where before... Whoever was around your geographical area, that's how you kind of like socially adopted to. That's why everything had like a certain geographical flavor. You'd talk the same way. You'd have the same vernacular. You'd have similar values because that's just like, yeah, you became a, if you lived in London or in Britain, you tended to become a Protestant. If you lived in France, well, until until recently, you would tend to become a Catholic. If you lived in China, you would tend to become a fucking communist. Because you just adapted this stuff. But now with the internet, I'm able to connect like you guys. I don't know. How many is in chat right now? Let me see. 300 of you in chat right now. Thank you, by the way. Hit that like, subscribe. You know the deal. 300 of you in chat. The, I guarantee you there's probably 100 different countries in here. You know that. Because like when you guys start throwing out super chats, I have to fucking look it up. I'm like, what the fuck is a rock? Thank you for the SDRs. Thank you for the... And it'll be like some weird symbol where it's like a triangle upside down with a J through it and then two lines. And I'm like, what currency is this? You find out something from like Battlestar Galactica. You're like, thank you for the... Thank you for the Starbucks, kid. Um, Yeah, double entendre. So this is like a VLAN of human sociability. And this is like the double-edged sword of communities and why I don't care if it's getting worse for men. You can believe and want to believe and delude yourself into anything. You will find your monkey sphere online. All you got to do, find 149 guys who believe the same dumb shit you do, and you will have yourself a community. You can live an entire life like that. You can live an entire life believing in Jewish conspiracies. So all you got to find is 149 more guys that have nothing but time to talk about it on your community. You want to find virgins talking about never getting laid? You got to find 149 of those and you got yourself a community. That's why I consider everything on the internet is lying. I even tell guys this. There was a guy yesterday, that one, I think I showed you guys this. He was, I don't know how to meet women or whatever and I don't know what to do. A lot of you guys just yelled at him, but I'm like, fine. I actually gave out a proper thread because I don't know where his problem is. You know, the standard stuff, Glover, Manuel Smith, covert contracts, being attractive, don't be unattractive. And I'm like, look, don't tell me, thanks, man. I'll work on it. Don't say, hey, appreciate this. Don't say any of that. I don't, don't even respond to me. In fact, don't even trust me. Try out some of the stuff yourself. If it works, continue on. If it doesn't, don't. Because most people are so deluded by their own little monkey sphere, their own little VLAN of human interaction, that they are completely detached from reality. And what did I just say before? If everybody's a lie and everything's a delusional bubble, what can you trust? You can trust what you can see. You can trust what you can touch and you can trust what's immediately around you. And again, this is why I do, I make the best effort, mostly because I don't want to be that piece of shit grifter. I, it's a self-respect thing. Same as the military. Even when I didn't want to be there, I did my job because I just don't want to be that fucking guy. But the idea is I want this stuff to map to real life as much as possible. So I don't watch Manosphere content because they're talking about, I can't, 
Somebody name off some of the names that Rolo keeps bitching about. It's like a, a running gag right now where he's like, this is just like a, a something Billa, and she always says this. I'm like, who the fuck is that? And then I realize, yeah, so he's correcting a lot of their bad information. I just don't get the bad information. I talked to a guy who's got a wife at home who's nagging him constantly and he wants to be better. I got a guy who's got a wife at home that's cheating on him and he wants to know how to divorce properly and get a new guy. I got a guy who's at home with his wife hasn't fucked him for like six months and he wants to go fuck somebody else because he's got to he's got to sleep with something. And he's not ready to leave his wife yet. The kids are like two years from getting at home. Stuff like this. I got a guy who's at home, just became a father, and now the wife stops wanting to have sex. Like real life situations. And I'd say this, this is great. Because yeah, it's a VLAN. Yeah, it's a little monkey sphere. But at least it's attached to attached to real life. And it, as long as you attach everything you see and hear online to real life, I don't think you can ever delude yourself. Not to like a, a pathological extent, you know? Politics, it's a great example of that one too. Like I watch the political stuff, but in Canada is kind of interesting right now anyway because it's so shitty, but I always try to attach it to reality, which it's really hard to do because right now, like I'm, I hate Trudeau. I fucking hate him. I think he's horrible. I don't think I like any of his policies. It's not helping anybody, but a very specific group of people that, that vote for him, like 30% of the country at the expense of 70%. But... When you start watching Andrew Trudeau political stuff, you start getting into lizard people, conspiracy stuff, conspiracy this. I'm like, how about this? He just stomped on old ladies with horses. I can see that. It's right there. I can go to Ottawa. I can see him yelling at shit. Yeah, and Nick here has got a great point in chat too on all this stuff. I'd rather have one friend who will question me if I start riding the mind fuck roller coaster. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's another part of it, too. Like, when you get into your monkey sphere, you can't fully trust people. Like, I don't know if you know this, but I don't have a very positive impression of the red pill. I don't like red... Even the guys who are red pill, and I know, and I trust their opinions, and I trust their advice, and I know their stuff is good. There's always... I think Rolo calls it the doomsayer, which I still haven't been able to find, like, an official version of that. But I like what he's saying, and I go with it. The doomsayer. And I'd, I'd expect the same thing back. And actually, I know the same thing back. Like Nick, or Wine More Please, or Rule Zero Dad, or S-Curve Much, or I guess Physician Rehab, you guys call them on here. I know for a fact, if I start getting here talking about them 304s belonging to the streets and 50% of girls are getting flown out to Dubai to get shit on, first off, they'd stop watching. Which, I appreciate this, by the way. I know Wine More Please is time. If you count how much he earns versus that, it's probably like, he's definitely... I'm definitely getting like a thousand dollars of his time an hour. <laughs> so yeah, kudos to that. Yeah. But yeah, uh, if they'd stop watching. They'd probably call me a fucking retard. And I, and to be fair, it's true. Like I've, they've seen me at my worst. I've seen them at their worst. We've seen each other at our best. So we know better, but you always have to have that certain level of dislike. You got to hate, you got to hate your monkey sphere just a little bit, just a little bit. I always hate this red pill stuff. Hate the nachos. I'll play the nachos. Don't get me wrong. Roland and I will sit here ranting about JF Garpy or laughing at tards for being tards and this big rant about being run up the flagpole for sure. But I always make sure to let you guys know. It's like, I get it. This is just, this is just some drama to drive up some subscribership. So yeah, and you're not going to like it. Even that, like when I do chick talks, I still love when you guys leave comments. This is solely a digression, but fuck it, whatever. When you guys leave comments at TikTok, it's like, I didn't come here for this shit. I came here for sexual dynamics, like Mids Watch stuff or the podcast. Why you stop doing this shit? But then I'll always, and I always talk with you guys like in Patreon. In other words, I'm like, how, like, what was your, what was your Ryan pipeline? And it used to be the, the Rolo Rich or the Rich Rolo Ryan pipeline. I found Richard Cooper, introduced me to Rolo Tomasi and that's how I found you. Now some of the pipelines are getting fucking weird. And I think it's kind of cool. I found you when you were playing Mega Man 2. And from there, Athel K, and then to here, I'm like, what in the fuck? So yeah, like I don't like the nacho cheese red meat drama shit as many as as much as the next guy. But unfortunately, in the way the economies are set up right now, is you have to become known before you become valued. And the best way to get known is to be a fucking clown. <laughs> but how do you become a clown when you're too have too much self respect to want to be a clown? So far, my best answer is shit posting in video games. So yeah, yeah, Savo, Roland, Ryan—that was my pipeline. Yeah, everybody's got a, a Minecraft pipeline. You see what I mean? Find a gal who drinks clamato and beer. Oh, dude, clam eyes are the best. That's the only time I'll make clam references that don't involve vaginas. By the way, 
Yeah, clowning is profitable. It is. But that's the thing. There's nothing to clowning. It's empty. It's gone. I'll make a video about some trending topical thing, and then 15 minutes afterwards, nobody will ever watch it again. So what you have to constantly do is clown more and clown more. And that's at the point now you got like girls like Pearly. Let's talk to the anti-Semite who thinks the Holocaust never happened. And I'm like, are we at that level of I need attention that bad? Like, fair enough. I don't know. I couldn't do it. I won't do it. <laughs> I won't do it. Couldn't do it. So that's why I don't care if it's getting worse for men. Because the guys who care if it's getting worse for men, they have, it's called audience capture. And I go, I, I try to keep this focused on you, but this is me bre like... Airplane food on this is the airplane food comedian joke. I get it. Bear with. We'll we'll tie it back to you. I promise. I promise. I promise. Uh it's getting worse for men. Jordan Peterson was did this, where it's always about we gotta help men. And so they talk to guys and they generally want to help and they like the idea of men getting help and fixing things. There's the covert contract of that. If you guys don't help yourself, it makes me a little bit resentful. And then you get a lot of guys that are just really bitter and they start just shitting on the audience. Like not in that, yeah, yell at us coach. Not that kind of way. More like the fuck you. And then guys are kind of like, I don't know. He just started yelling at me. Great example for that. Uh, Roman McClay wrote his book, uh, Sanction, and then murdered six people. <laughs> But I remember, I'm like, all right, I'm going to try this out. And it was like a million words. What the fuck? It's like 800 pages. I'm like, all right. So I started the first chapter. And the entire first chapter was him saying, you know what? You're not smart enough. You're not as smart as me. You're not going to understand this. You're totally going to not get it. And I'm like, why am I reading a book that just right out the gates calling me a stupid piece of shit? I'm like, nah, man, I ain't doing it. It's probably why he murdered the people. He's like, everybody doesn't get this thing. I put in all the Nietzsche quotes. How do they not know? 800 pages, 400 pages of that were Nietzsche quotes and Marcus Aurelius. I'm like, what the fuck? I should have just bought the Euchre board. Oh, you've never heard of Roman McClay. Oh, well, let me, let me. <laughs> I think I even have a video on my channel on him, which is actually kind of, it's good. I mean, essentially, he was just like the biggest deal and everybody was latching onto him as the next biggest thing in the, the manosphere. And then he went and murdered a bunch of people. And then everybody started deleting videos. They're like, oh, shit, got to pretend like I never knew him. But the Internet never forgot. I managed to save a couple of those a couple of those two hour fluffing sessions. Uh, back to the point, the audience capture. So you start to care about guys. Peterson loved caring about it. He loved hearing the stories. He kind of got hooked on the feedback. The idea is I do this. Men get fixed or fix themselves. They come back to me and thank me for it. It's a reinforcement cycle. But the audience doesn't know what they want. Guys who are in trouble, guys who have bad marriages, guys who have bad, you know, sex lives, they don't know what they want. They only know what they think they want. And so they start telling you, oh, talk about uh, the, the Bila chick. Talk about this. Talk about that. And as a guy, well, like, you know what? They've been so good to me. They're giving me validation. They're giving me super chats. Of course. Of course. Let's try. Let's take a look at this. Why not? What's the harm in that? And it's all these little concessions you make. Carl used to talk about it. The death by a thousand concessions. And then as you make concessions, all right, we'll talk about this. And that's how you get like serious people talking about the, the effect AI sex porn is going to have on marriage rates in the 21st century. And you're just like, what the fuck, man? Audience capture. And then like Lenny of Mice and Men, they just wanted to pet the rabbit, but they keep snapping the damn rabbit's neck. And then they drive guys like Peterson to taking diazepams, killing himself, having a detox. And then what's the result of this? You end up with like your 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 dad 2.0 shell of a man. I I honestly, it, it, it bothers me to watch that. And it's a great cautionary tale to watch guys like Peterson acting like a former shell of himself. Take that woke feminists. I'm like, ah, oh, God. Damn it. He's like a clown. But they don't know they're clowns because that's what the audience keeps telling him. You will get into that own little filter bubble. And then this is where frame really helps. You have to know what you want, whether you're a brand online or a guy in a marriage or a single guy or whatever. All of this stuff always influences you. Your monkey sphere will influence you. Yeah, I just want to look up AI, you know, boba chicks. That's great. Now you're in this rabbit hole of MGTOW stuff. But if you have your own frame, your own personal worldview your own mental point of origin you know what you want out of life you know what you're willing to put up with you know what you're not willing to put up with you get all of these things together all of it everything every single thing and you know it and you know it's what's important to you none of this stuff can affect you you can go down the january 6th rabbit hole and not come out the other side blaming the jews for your life you can come out the other side of 
like watching too much of the view and not think, oh, men are the problem and blah, blah, blah. And I need to go on there and, you know, you don't have to pull a Mark Manson or a Tucker Max where now all of a sudden you're just appealing to women or a, a Pinker, Steven Pinker, where all of a sudden you're like ignoring the results and the outcomes of all of your research. Or as Rollo would say, Jeff Miller, where it's like, you know from your professional career that the lifestyle that you have is not optimal, but you shouldn't be cheerleading it. All that stuff. And those are big examples that we kind of all know from like common experience, but from your own personal life. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a case of all the henpecked husbands that you hang out with on the weekends, bitching and moaning and complaining, and you don't start bringing that shit into your life. And that's why I, and that's why the whole book's on goddamn frame. And I go into detail, even Rich, he's like, ah, the shaving your balls thing was kind of gay, but I get why it's in there. He's like, good book. I'm like, thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, if it can sell as good as his, now we're there, now we're getting somewhere. Not quite there, but we're getting close. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's all little things. All little things that make a difference. That's why I don't care if it's getting worse for men. If it's something is really getting worse for you and you aren't fixing the smallest minute in your life, like if you can't go work out, ah, I'm sucked, I'm depressed, and girls won't fuck me. Well, how's your gym going? Why? Well, that's your answer for everything. No, that's the start of the answer for everything. Because if I can trust, you can do the smallest, selfishest, doesn't require anything. You can work out and it doesn't require anything from anybody. You don't need somebody to call you. You don't need somebody to help you. You don't need somebody to agree with you. You don't need anything. You need something that's heavy and you need the ability to walk over to it, pick it up in a certain way and put it down eight times for like 30 minutes, three times a week. That's 90 minutes. That's a movie. You can watch Die Hard, and that would take the same amount of time that your workout would take for a full. If you can't do that, one selfish act, nobody can bother you when you're working out. Of course not. Why? If you have a weight over your head and your phone rings, what are you going to do? Drop the weight on your head and go answer the phone? No. You're like, it can wait. Everything can wait. Right now, I'm doing this for me. If you can't do that, then what do I care what you're bitching about? How do I know that what you're complaining about is worth complaining about? Sometimes things really are super tragic and really need to be complained about because, like, I didn't know it could be that bad. But most things aren't, man. Most things aren't. Because there's a monkey spear to talk about it. <laughs> but yeah, if I, I'll trust you if you're bitching about something. Oh, the fucking gym sucks. Really? Why does it suck? Ah, because they don't have anything above a 50 weight. It's like a gym at a hotel. And I look at the guy like, oh, I can see he lifts, but he wants to lift more and he can't lift. That's a complaint I can get behind. There's a solution to it. I mean, my building had that. Our hand weights never went past 50 pounds. We only had two 45s. What did I do? I was like, oh, I could petition the whole thing here, but most people in the building aren't big lifters anyway. I'll just go down to the, the, the gym store, pick up some extra 45s and some 65 pound dumbbells and donate it to the gym. Well, why are you paying for it? Because I want it, don't I? How bad do I want it? I want it bad enough that I'm willing to give $100 of weights in there. And now I got a third set of plates. Awesome. Problem solved. Bitching there has a solution. But then everybody keeps throwing their morality into it. Oh, well, but, but they should do this. Like, yeah, yeah, should. The building should be doing that. But if I wait for them to do that, I'm not working out. So fuck it. <laughs> How bad do I want it? All right, Sam Whiskey and then statistics. Thank you, sir. $9. Do you see what I mean? $9.99 in Super Chat. Guys, it, it only takes a penny so that you don't have to talk about the cuck article. <laughs> if she leaves... She can still be tracked if you have access to the breast implant serial number you paid for, hypothetically speaking, of course. What the fuck? What? Why? What? Why? Why? Talk about like the G like the track like the dog tag trackers on girls. Okay, yeah, hypothetically speaking, of course. That's a good piece of information. I don't know how to apply like I guess if she gets murdered. Oh, don't murder your wife. Murder your wife, and they're like, wait a minute. She's been dead too long. We can't identify the body. They're like, this serial number looks familiar. Mr. OJ, we'd like to have a word with you. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, six pack. I'm with you. A Jesus Christ, Sam moment. Boob Lojack. <laughs> Thanks for telling me not to murder my wife. What can I say, Winemore? This channel will always deliver the top tier advice that men need to know in this day and age. You've heard it here first, guys. Do not murder your wife. I don't, I normally don't give you prescriptive advice. I don't tell you what you should not do, but I'm saying in this case, I'm making an exception. You should not murder your wife. Now, self-defense, on the other hand, if she comes at you with a gun, yeah. But don't be like that guy on Twitter last night. Once the threat is alleviated, don't start putting more into her. 
Yeah, damn, who'd have thunk? I know, sometimes you just have to say these things, right? Anyways, enough goofing around. Let's get some more shit posts. We're going to double up on these. One of the guys who ran the Red Pill channel sent me a message. I actually appreciate that you took it from an idea-based perspective instead of ever resorting to personal attack. Like, if this movement is actually going to be dangerous, do we need to understand it so that we can take it down? I knew going into it that this might be a hot mess. I'm not going to have those guys back on my channel again. Absolutely not. Boom, what's up, fam? Got some big news to share that unfortunately is not so good. So I'm gonna jump right into it. You're gonna watch this video and you're gonna cry. At least we can laugh at your ass as you cry like in, in the corner like a little f***ing girl in the fetal position. Jason, $6.99. I'm not gonna lie, the 69, it's too bad that you couldn't do like multiple pennies because like the 69, 420 would be a hilarious like super chat amount. <laughs> But what can I say? The 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 thirteen year old me that was in the in the nineties or two thousands would have been absolutely livid about seeing it on there. This is awesome, or not livid, but happy. Uh, Ryan, you're one of the only red pill. Co Stop calling me a coach. God damn it. That go into the nuances of getting better via social skills, etc. Just wanted to say thank you for all the value, dude. Like, I'll take your money, and absolutely, if you want to thank me, a super chat is the way to do it. But the the big thank you is just applying it, applying it, using it, and having it work. For the most part, I think Ali got it right. It's not that I'm a coach. It's not that I'm a life whatever trying to help people. I don't think any of that shit. I think it's all retarded. Uh, I kind of almost think of this like a like an anthropologist. It's really just like 10 years being in a retarded space with retarded people that came up with decent ideas. And I'm just expressing them. Oh, excuse me. Step one, don't marry your intended victim. Well, that helps too. All right, you guys are getting a little bit too into the details of how not to murder your wife. <laughs> But statistics were never right anyways. This one, I don't know. It comes up. I can't tell how much of this is monkey sphere uh, delusion or how much of this is actually real. But there's this weird thing where guys like to see statistics. Somebody actually asked me in my uh, Patreon. That's why I'm bringing it up. So I'm like, maybe it's touched reality. I don't know. What statistics are there? Like what what tips and tricks can you offer? What what signs am I looking for? Everybody's looking for symbols. And I think this is a this is an element of of unhealthy narcissism run amok with like a veneer of science over it. You know, if you guys don't know, narcissism is not just being delusions of grandeur. It really is pathological masculinity, and part of it involves making up an identity for yourself. It's not a real identity. It's one that you want to aspire to, like president of the manosphere. It's the reason I put his there. It's a perfect example. He he thinks of himself as the guy who runs. All the men online. I am the president of the man. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, really, guy. But he makes you guys. And this is the narcissistic fantasy. And then the president of the manosphere, there's a whole bunch of symbology attached to it. Oh, you need to have a, a, a an eagle holding an olive leaf, olive branch, right? And shit like that. Or you have to wear your MAGA hat and you have to have the American flag and you have to have all these symbols. The woman has to be a 10 out of 10, like all of these things. And that's just one example. There's tons of examples. Basically, if you don't need the people around you to be people, you need them to be archetypes. And if they have to fit certain checklist criteria, it's probably a narcissistic fantasy. And then you make everybody else reinforce it. That's the fuel. Um, another example that's probably a little closer to a lot of young guys' hearts is that they saw Tate and Fresh and Fit and shit talking about, you want your harem of women. You need to have six girls that are at home as your sex slaves all the time. And they want that. Not because they want it, but because somebody told them to have it as a fantasy. And so that's what they want. Nothing but nines or tens, bro. But the problem with that is the symbols don't tie to reality. Like, for example, the last psychiatrist had a great article. Uh, if if you like your girl in white shoes, you might be a narcissist. And he pointed out that uh, it was a Kim Basinger movie, nine and a half weeks where she wore white heels on this thing. A blonde girl, white heels. And so for a lot of like East Indian guys, you know, the Bob's and Vagine joke, they always want the hot blondes. They just want a blonde chick because that's like a status symbol to them. That's the idea of, oh, the great American woman. That's what you get. And if you guys have ever been in a diverse culture, like I had this in my hometown. There was a, a big uh, East Indian community that moved there in the 80s. And they would all, they all like dating a white girl was like a big flex. Like, oh, dude, you're dating that. But it was never like the hot white girls. It was always like the, 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 the not even the mids, like the fours. And they were bragging about it. And you're like, oh, man. And then you realize to some extent that like, that's a symbol. It's not that she has to be good looking. It's not that she has to be a great wife or mother or anything or put out. She just has to have like the blonde hair and white. Good. But like, oh, she's fuck. Why would you date her? She's horrible. Hate her a little bit. Coach Ryan Stone, Sam Whiskey. Thank you for the $1.99 super chat. Look at that. 
comes in with the wife murder and then comes out with a little bit of hate. We're already saving lives, moving it up the moving up the thing. Yeah, I'm all about redheads. Yeah, there's all these kind of symbols, all the fetishes, like the guys who like submissive Asian women. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter if she's actually submissive. They just like the idea of an Asian girl or crying and during sex or some weird fucking tentacle porn shit. So the problem with these symbols then is if you're with somebody and they don't adhere to the symbol, if they don't feed the fantasy, it drives guys into a rage. Not anger. Anger is a grievance. Rage is more limbic. It's like your worldview and the other person's not adhering to it. It's it's an identity attack on your identity. And you can, dude, you can map this to examples of anything. Woke people, feminists, guys. It's it's pervasive. It, it really is. Narcissism. And for women, it's honestly, that's the, when I say men are being raised as effective women, it's that they're developing narcissism. And that has to do with the atomization of society. It's a whole thing. I'm not going to get into it. It's too big brain shit. I'd rather be just sit here and talk about our dicks and have fun. But you'll see it. You'll see it if you look around. Guys, same thing, because they're so detached from reality because of those aforementioned VLANs of humanity we got now, the monkey spheres. They don't have to be attached to reality. They just want symbols. That's why guys want anime waifu broads. And that's why chicks in cosplay who are otherwise ugly, they're like, oh yeah, but she looks like Faye from Cowboy Bebop. She's my dream. Meanwhile, she beats the kids. She doesn't put out. She's on drugs. But it was like, it doesn't matter. That's great. So you're like, how do I get statistics to fit this? The problem with that is when you're looking at statistics, you want people to show you certain statistics to adhere to whatever symbols you want. And if you don't know what symbols you want, you look at those statistics to develop the symbols that you want. And that's the problem using these checklists to find what you want out of life or what to defend against. So you see these guys with like an almost hysterical hyper focus on low notch count girls or only fucking virgins. It's like how many, there's a lot of virgins who married their high school sweetheart, got divorced. Dude, I remember that. It was like some of the easiest girls to pick up at the bar, but also the ones that didn't put up with a lot of shit were girls that were like 25 and divorced. Yeah, we got married at 17 and by 24, it didn't work out for whatever reason. And now you're divorced. So you see like a 25 year old divorced chick and you're like, holy shit, so much fun. It's great. I can still remember there was this one chick It was in college. Her name was Bonnie. We used to do taek- like she was in my Taekwondo class back when I was doing it. It was fun. But yeah, she was so much fun. But that's the point with these statistics, right? Then you get hyper-focused on these little details. And the problem with statistics is A, they lie. Just because there's a statistic doesn't mean it's any good. You have to rely on the person making the statistic made a good statistic. And oftentimes they don't. You can actually, there's companies out there, especially government think tank companies that have Whatever political party's policy they want. Canada has this, a lot of ours. That's where you see all these stats, like 70% of people think the trucker convoy was terrorists, or that Americans were doing this, or that Trudeau was taking things in the wrong direction. They they craft a study in such a way to get the result that they already want. So the Liberal Party wanted some authority to point to. So they talked to, I think it was Ipsos or Angus, Angus Reed or something like that. Anyways, so how do they make their studies? Turns out on this one, they like, okay, well, people apply to work online for us. We pay them a nominal salary and then, you know, they fill in all their demographic information and then we send them out studies from time to time. So who's the one who even knows about this? Do you think some Albertan rancher or a guy working in a lumber mill in BC or some dude who's in a mechanic shop in London, Ontario is going to pay attention to like Angus Reed signups for polls? No. Do you know who is going to sign up? Government employees who have to know about this stuff and they learned it through school. Students who have nothing better but time want to earn some income. You know, woke people who love to manipulate the system. So you have such a skewed example that they could pull for anything and you're going to get the exact answer you want that demographic to believe. So it's a reinforcement thing. Yeah, the study could have been made perfectly valid. The, the methods are good. The thing is good, but they've completely spoiled how they get it. And then whenever you point to that, you're like, well, statistical, and, and that's what they do. They point to, well, the statistical analysis was good. Our p-values were good. That's great. But all you did was you asked the right type of people to give you the right type of answer. So why am I going to trust the statistic? 50% of men say women are whores. Well, how come it's 50% of men who aren't getting laid that say women are whores? Is that useful for me? 50% of marriages end a divorce. Maybe. That's true. And it probably it is true. What kind of men is it? And you look at the kind of guys, it's the guys that lean with their paychecks, right? You guys see it's the guys that want to be providers. The guys who are 
more on the alpha side of things, the more sexual desire first and everything else comes after, their marriages tend to stick together. Then you get like, you know, incestual statistics where a lot of women looked at that whole 50% divorce statistic and they noticed it was upper middle class people tend to keep their marriages together more. They're like, well, that's the trick. You got to be a scientist or a university grad. And that's why women are loving university. It's the MRS degree with extra steps. Of course, you look at that in that statistic is like, what is what does that mean? And all they said is just longevity. Are they still married? Did they get divorced? Not are they happy? Not do they have a sex life? Not is anybody getting what they want? Not, you know, whatever it is you want out of life. You didn't know that, but all you see is 50% divorce. And you assume, well, that, and then that changes how you think about it. So now you're not looking at how do I have a happy relationship, like a good fulfilling relationship with somebody. You're like divorce statistic. Therefore, longevity is the only one that matters. And you don't know that you're doing it, but you are doing it. You're getting gaslit into creating your own Overton window that's not actually focused on your own benefit. So you look at these stats and they don't help. And that's why I'm like, I don't trust statistics. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them because statistics will tell you anything. And that's it. So some people make shitty statistics to tell you what you want to hear. Some people act or they find biased groups to find the statistics that are well done to lead you in what direction you want them to think, or they want you to think, even though everything else they do was hundred percent by the book. And then there's a third group. I don't know where they are. I've never seen ones that are useful that actually like maybe like the GSS that, uh, general, uh, census, the Canadian census used to be pretty good too, but it never dealt with sex. It was always like, what's the, what's the median income of this postal code in Canada? The Canada long form census is actually really good as a business person. Go check it out. It's never updated quite as fast as it should be. And during Harper's years, there were some years where it got done. But if you ever wanted to start a business and see like the demographics of your area, it's a great one for it. Like when I lived in Victoria, the part of town I lived in, I'm like, what's the median income here? And then I found out it was $45,000 a year to $55,000. Okay. So if you wanted to start a business there, what kind of things are people in that? Like what kind of disposable income do people that make that much money make? And then you found like, everybody's house poor, so nobody really spent anything. So you probably shouldn't have a business, except for a pub. So then if I wanted to start a business, I would know that. But that's the thing, though. Those statistics are, aren't are about sex. And this is red pill thing is mostly about sex and relationships. So I just wouldn't trust anything because you can't. And I tried talking about this before. Then you got the ethical boards. Like for most universities, they want grant funding. And so they petition the government. Hey, you want to do a study on this? Nobody's going to fund a study on, hey, I want to see... Like how many dicks a girl sucks before, before she's like horrible marriage material or something, right? Who do you think is going to sign off on that? Do you think somebody's going to be like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. Here's some money. No, they're going to be like the chick on the fucking hiring board or the ethics committee is going to be like, no, you absolutely cannot do this. This is horrific. Not since the Austrian painter has somebody tried to do a study like this. And so then you get to the situation where the guys, they can't study that. But what can they study? Well, I want to do a study on how men ain't shit. And the girl's like, you know what, that study, I think it's worth doing. It's good to see. Why are men falling behind? Well, we'll do that study too. It's all those studies and shit that doesn't matter because the people who control what gets studied and what doesn't get studied, you know, with the purse strings, won't fund it. And then it gets at the point that if you're the people doing the statistical research, you already know. You know this walking in. Why? Because you talk to other researchers. You have your own statistical analysis research monkey sphere. And you know what stuff will make it muster and you know what stuff won't. And maybe like, I wanted to, stu to study dick sucking. So if they're not going to do it here, I'm just going to go be a plumber and they leave. And then the ones that study that stuff that gets like, why man ain't shit. Those people stay in and the people that convince themselves that that's the way to study it, they change how they think. So now they don't even see it as bad what they're doing. That's why they wholeheartedly agree. No, this is a perfectly good statistical analysis. They lie to themselves to the point that they believe it, but nothing ever helps ever. I have yet to see anybody provide a study to any red pill guy and have them say, oh, this is great. This changes everything. And then they adopt strategies to fit that. It's always, always the case where a bunch of dudes tried some shit and it started to work in a certain way. And then we go look up the studies that reflect that and then repeat it to other people as like a, as like a appeal to authority. Wait, are you guys just as bad as everybody else? I'm like, no, sometimes guys need that authority to believe stuff. And so it's just a persuasion technique. Oh, that's so manipulative. Yeah, well, you know, welcome to the world. Everybody's manipulative. Even the red pill guys? Yeah. Yeah. I think Whisper said it best. 
don't think just because somebody is red pill that they got your own best interest at heart. They don't. Tate in his personal life, absolutely red pilled to a fault. A little excessive. Not good at it, but he was there. Ugh. So what you're saying is it's more propaganda than science. It's worse than that. It's just, it's delusion. It's a fiction. It's a narrative. It's a story. It's a mental model. So you get these situations then. And the reason why I like the red pill side of it better. How did he put it? Yeah, it was uh, just because somebody's red pill doesn't mean they're your friend. Like he's like, I'll steal your lunch and you're all uh, yeah, I'll steal your lunch. I'll sleep with your woman and I don't care, but I won't bullshit you. It's not because I like you. It's not because I don't think you deserve it. It's just because I hate bullshit. And that's the one thing I always tell you guys. It's like, I just I just don't want to be that fucking guy. I don't want to be that clown that lies to you and tells you what you want to hear to make money. I'm perfectly happy to say the best example of what I think Red Pill has, what Red Pill offers, and the outcomes of it. I have no problem speaking my mind if I find a con content creator is not work worthing with or worth working with. Like I've asked her all of this too. It's like, yeah, everybody, everybody was sucking Tate's dick for the longest time, and now that he's going to jail with all the woman laundering, everybody's like, oh, that's not really good. I'm like, no, no, no. Day one, day one, have I ever changed my opinion on this stuff? No, and it's usually pretty easy to tell. You just gotta look. Like if you've raised around enough piece of shit people, you can kind of get a vibe for it. Like I can tell, like, you know, Pearly, I don't really have a problem with her as a person, but I can tell she's very manipulative and Rolo's right. She is a hack. She doesn't really know red pill. She's just using it like the Redditor way. You know, that whole how men take a photo and how women take a photo. It's basically like a vessel to promote her greatness. So I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Can't really stop her from doing it. I don't, can't fault her for it. She's got a goal. She's doing what she wants. But at the same time, I'm not going to feed into it. I'm not going to be part of uh, the, the pearly power hour. So yeah, yeah, all models being wrong, some being useful is broadly applicable. Absolutely. In this case, yeah, and these, these statistics, always wrong. To some extent, they're wrong, but some of them are useful. That's why I liked Dalrock's stuff, because he always kind of, he would just show trends. Whether it mattered, like he has one, I used it a lot, where it's, um, he's talking about how the marriage market is going to get worse. And he was pointing out how, if you look at the studies of women who aren't getting married, you have to look at 20 to 25 year olds, the trend was going up. 30 to 35 year olds was going up a lot or not as much, but you have to look at girls over time. So the 30 to 35 year olds that they were trending in 2009 were the 20 to 25 year olds in 1999. And you would notice that if you follow those girls, okay, so this is where the thing I came up with where it was, uh, if you're not married by 30, about 5% of you will get married. It means you're, it's never going to happen. And that's how you do it. You look at it that way. So even then, as a girl, that just lets, unless you know as a guy, if you find a girl who's in her 30s, chances are you're probably not going to want to marry her. Now, you map that one to real life. How many guys have dated 30-year-olds wanted to settle down? A lot of guys don't. A lot of guys don't. And you don't even, well, what, about the, what about Kate? It's like, I don't give a fuck. Look. All these guys in their 40s dating, they're dating 30-year-olds, dating. You know, wife them up. And these 30-year-old girls keep running through the newest crop of divorced guys, of younger guys who just want to get some and all that shit, right? They're not marrying, though. So that's just the trend. And that's why I love when you see guys bitching about stuff like this. Oh, it's, look at this statistic. Men are fucked. Well, look at this statistic. Everybody's getting pumped and dumped. If they're, if they're 30 and they haven't settled down yet, they're probably not going to. But even then, that doesn't tell a girl anything. Like, what does that mean? Well, it means settle down before 30. Well, okay, I'll just do that then. Let me just walk up and grab a husband. Uh, Larry Dixon, $50 super chat, 10 cuck articles of heartfelt, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for everything. Don't worries, man. Like I said, I'll keep running my mouth if you keep listening. Uh, back to the statistics. Yeah, yeah. But what's that supposed to mean? Oh, I'll just grab a husband before 30. Easy. This is a great example from the female side of things, why statistics aren't helpful. What does that even mean? Why did those girls not get husbands before 30? Is it because they, I mean, there's a possibility they just didn't want one. And Kate will cheerlead that one. Maybe. Maybe that's the case. Maybe they just don't want one. Maybe they don't need no man. I don't buy it. I have a hard time believing that all of a sudden you throw Tinder and birth control pills and then women get rid of a million years of evolution. I don't buy it. But it's possible. It's also possible that whatever skill set as a woman you need 
to be able to land a man and keep them in some form of long-term relationship that they aren't learning it or they're ignoring it. That's also possible. It could just be the case that these ones would have been forced to be married back in the day. You know, pressure from parents or pressure from society or something or arranged marriages or whatever. And those were such horrible marriages that the guy would have killed himself in a murder-suicide. That's also possible. In that case, it's not a bad thing. If these were always the ones, they're like, and this is why everybody's talking about now, oh, the divorce statistics getting better now. A lot less people are getting divorced. It's because a lot less people are getting married. And it just so happens, if you're the kind of guy who's like, you know what, fuck it, I'm not getting married. You are most likely to be that guy who would have been divorced anyway. So it skews the stats. It doesn't mean people have fundamentally changed, even though statistics are showing you that they are. It just means people are just getting to the outcome quicker. Like, why bother getting divorced when I could just stay single now and keep most of my stuff? You're like, oh, fair enough. Fair enough, you could do that. So statistics don't really help you. And what do you do when, like, all the authority and all the statistics aren't doing anything for you? Well, what can you see? What can you touch? What's around you? What can you, what can you, what can you physically address? And that's just it. There's a girl right in front of you. Look at that. She's 23. She's hot. She's bubbly. She's spinny. She uh, wants to have fun, doesn't want to settle down. All right. Well, she doesn't want to settle down, so why am I going to force it? You can only settle down with women who want to settle down. And most girls that are 23 don't. Mine did. That was pretty cool. I appreciate her for that one. But most didn't. And I knew that because 99% uh, of girls I dated, you know, dated, never wanted to settle down. One just so happened to. And even then, that's not, it's, that's one statistic from one guy. I could say, you know, one out of 50 will want to settle down. So you got to date 50 girls. And then you get that stupid Myron shit. If you don't have 50 notches, you're not a real man. Well, it's like, way to take a statistic and just autistic run with it, man. Or autistically run with it. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it seems like the need for marriage. And that's the other thing. winemore has got a good point there. Maybe the need for it's on the decline. Maybe you don't need it. I mean, you don't need a wife to have a kid. You don't. You just need to put your dick into a girl and have her not take plan B or get an abortion. That's ultimately, if you want to deconstruct the family unit, that's really what it is. Men and women having kids and the kid being raised to adulthood properly. You know, healthy to the point that they can go forward and, you know, have their own. That's just it. Propagation. And marriage was a great system to get there. Absolutely. But is it the system that's great in this environment? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. I really don't. I think people think they know. They think they want to believe that it's a certain way, but you don't really know. Statistics will tell you one thing or another. You know, uh, Rollo talks about it, how black America, zero rates of marriage. Nobody's getting married, but fathers are in the kid's life and more engaged. Maybe that's because he's the baby daddy and he comes over on the weekends. Maybe it's because they just live together, but they're not married. Does it matter? The kids are getting healthier and happier. Then there's other people that marry and they're married and they're happy and their kids are being raised happy and healthy and that works too. It turns out, so if like you can be married or not married and raise healthy kids, what is it? Maybe it's not about the marriage itself. Maybe it's about something else. And this is where I'd argue Red Pill is absolutely on point. It's just about your relationship to the people around you, your boundaries, your expectations, your discretion, all that stuff. Yeah, as some guys cheat on their wives and the wives still stick around. Absolutely, they do. How do they do that? I don't know, little discretion. They don't rub their wife's face in it. They don't embarrass her in public. They keep it on the down low. They do it when they're on vacation. They offer plausible deniability. That works. Some guys are extremely loyal to their wives and their wives put out all the time and everybody's happy. Yay, it works great too. Again, the only thing that seems to matter is you. Who'd have thunk? Once you start taking control of your life, things get better for you. John Smith, oh, thank you, sir. $5, one cent, super chat. Stats only point where more questions need to be asked and where tools can be applied. Stats are not for the individual data point. Oh, yeah. So never run your life by a statistic. Run your life by what you can see, what you can touch, what other men, and this is where like, the only expansion of that, what I can see and what I can touch is real thing, I would say is the notes of swapping notes with men. Because it's essentially somebody else doing that and you're getting direct information from them. That one degree of separation is as far as you want to go. Because even now, I'm technically a second degree of separation. There's a guy who did something in his life and achieved a certain outcome, swapped a note. And then I saw that and adapted my life to it, and then I'm passing that off to you. That first degree, that second degree of separation, I like to think I'm doing it well. 
chances are I'm, I know I'm missing some details that may be important. And that's why you kind of have to do it multiple times to increase the chance that, you know, if I get a hundred guys doing the same thing and I'm reporting it back to you, it's less chance of me missing important details because it's just so much repetition. But I mean, I'm just one brand among many. There's tons of brands that are doing the same thing and they fucking suck so much dick. They suck mo so much dick. You'd almost think they were a female dating coach, you know? <laughs> you'd almost think they're on a podcast arguing with fucking Myron. <laughs> so in the end, I even tell you guys this. Don't trust me. Don't take me as gospel. Don't think of me as some Jordan Peterson dad tube or anything even close to that. I'm not, it's not me like trying to have ego. I'm just telling you, don't trust me. Try it. Take the things that require the least investment and the easiest effort to achieve that I talk about. Give it a shot. If you find it works, fuck, stick another foot in. Try some more shit. That's great. If it doesn't work and everything you've tried in mind is like, dude, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. Fuck it, man. Go watch somebody else. Like, I'm not even angry. I'm not shitting on you or nothing. I'm like, if my shit's not working, if the shit I tell you about's not working, why the fuck would you keep listening to me? Just don't. I think a lot of people are, are too invested in that too. Dude, they're loving like Tim Pool. Oh, I love Tim Pool. He's talking about revolution again. And then after like his cringe album and he was fucking his married coworkers and he treats everybody like shit and he fakes being swatted. And you're after a while, you're like, yeah, I still love, he's great. You're like, is he though? Do you really want to watch this anymore? And I'm not shitting on Tim. Tim's whatever. He wears a mean fucking beanie. And I miss his old Vice stuff back when Vice was about, I'm going to do drugs in Russia to prove the Russian drug problem. Yeah. Entertaining for a few hours, but I don't think people are taking advice from them. Well, it's, it's not so much like this one here. I actually don't want to give you advice on this one either. Most of the time when I tell you this stuff, it's just. It's almost like a how to think, not what to think. So I can kind of show you how not just me, but other people have praxeologically adapted the red pill. And then most of these stories give you an idea like, oh, a different way of looking at things, a different way of framing them frame praxeology volume one a way of framing them so that you can apply this to your own like decision making process at least because again it's such a simple system try something see if it works report findings repeat observe orient decide act o o d a observe orient decide act observe orient decide act the swapping notes is the observation post action the orientation is guys deciding what's their mental point of origin the decisions are the mental models. And then the action is the shit that you guys do at the end. So even if what I say here is 100% bullshit, but you still get that that right process in place to make better decisions in your own life, then fuck, good enough. If you want to thank me for that with the $6.99 420 Super Chat, I will take your money. I will absolutely take your money and I appreciate it. And it's, it's, it, is, it, is, it is nice to hear that you're helping. It's nice to hear that it's doing good for people. It absolutely is. But at the same time, I always keep in the back of my mind, every fucking narcissist grifter who's caught on amphetamines is thinking the same thing himself. It was almost like a joke. At first I thought, wow, this is cool. I'm really saving lives, you know? There was a super chat, my pinned tweet. Dude, you saved my life. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. Thank you very much, sir. And then I realized everybody has, everybody's, everybody has their life saved. Turns out the bar is so low on saving lives that I could just do like sit up here for an hour and skip rope and somebody whose life will be saved. <laughs> so I'm just kind of like, eh, it's for you. It's for you. Uh, Jason, $6.99 Super Chat 420. Thoughts on a prenup? Even if I'm my best option for my girl, should I get her to sign one anyways as insurance? It's a it's a tricky thing. I find it's it's mostly, and this is again, not legal advice. Every jurisdiction is different. You're going to want to talk to a professional lawyer in your jurisdiction. But false security, mostly. They have been thrown out for so many different reasons. And it's just really about how good the argument is. So if you say, I'm not marrying a girl unless she gets a prenup, that can be used as coercion. And then that can get it thrown out. Once you have a kid, whatever prenup you sign gets thrown out too. Because legally, you cannot have a contract that, that, you, that you say gives makes you do illegal things right now you can't make a contract to sell coke to somebody same as this once a kid is born you have certain legal obligations to that and if your prenup says something different well what takes precedence the law takes precedence 
And then here's the problem. Like everybody always has like a way to answer that. Well, that's fine. Get her to re-sign the prenup every year. Make her hire her own lawyer. Do it six months before you even propose a marriage. But that's the point. If you have to keep hodgepodging together this ad hoc system of prenups, dancing through all these hoops, maybe it's not the case that the prenup just requires 500 different steps to get working right. Maybe it's the idea of a prenup is just fucking retarded, you know? So far, the only legal mechanism I've seen that makes sense, and I still don't know how well it makes sense, is uh, blind, I think they call them blind trusts. The idea is you don't want to give that money to your bitch ex-wife to spend on shit. You want it to be for your kids, right? And apparently a lot of the wealthier people do this. They create a blind trust and they throw their money into it and they have somebody who runs the trust that's arm's length. Like you can't tell them what to do with it. You have no control over it. Once you put the money in there, it's gone. You will never touch it. It's not even yours anymore. It belongs to the trust. And then the only thing on the trust is like, okay, so the kid gets X amount of uh, percentage of the money when he's 18 and then this after college and this after 25. Essentially, it's a company that has a certain mandate. A lot of guys don't like that though because then you have to get you have to get a person in the trust you really trust. I haven't seen it examples of it and having people test it to see if it actually does hold on time. It's just, it's an interesting new thing that unfortunately most people don't actually have enough money to implement. So that's why you don't see it happening. So all these guys talking about divorce rape, I always laugh because I'm like, dude, if that was what your concern was, losing half your shit, you'd have been trying this blind trust thing because it's the best advice so far. But nobody has enough money to do it because it turns out all those financial instruments are expensive. And unless you're a billionaire, nobody's going to be trying it. So, meh. Anyways, so that's it for this one. Thank God we uh, ran out of time before the trolley problem thing. Uh, we're going to go to Clary's channel in about 15 minutes. So we're going to end it off with some shit posting and some T-Rex stuff. Don't forget the T-Rex army, by the way. Baby, I love you! Baby! I love the way girls smell. I love how you know, they always make sure, by and large, they shower. And they just have um, an, amazing, an amazing smell to them in general. T, 2458, Learning Corp, Little Red Riding Hood, take one.